forward Pinellas. I would like to uh, bring the meeting to order, please. And we'll start off with, um, hold on one moment. Yeah, it wasn't in my folder. Where? Okay, okay. Starting again. Hello. <laughs> Could I ask everyone to please stand for the invocation and the pledge? Thank you. Thank you. Wait, do you want to say the invocation? Huh? Hello there. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Go in ahead. The name in the name of the one true God who is known by many names, join us as we pray. We beseech your help and ask your mercy. Before we ask you for anything, we'd like to thank you for everything. Dear Lord, we gather here today, and as we gather, we invoke the spirit of unity and progress, harmony and advancement, and we pursue the purpose of this august body with fidelity and seek to bring together and create a better future for the residents and stakeholders of Pinellas County. We invoke the spirit of creativity, innovation, and resilience as we strive to lead in the ways that address the challenges facing our region and to be at the forefront of developing creative solutions to help us navigate these complex issues. We invoke the spirit of inclusiveness and diversity as we demonstrate our commitment to creating a future that works for everyone, helping us to ensure that the voices of all stakeholders are heard and respected, allow our work to be meaningful, and a contribution towards building a more equitable and just community where everyone has the opportunity to thrive. And finally, Lord, we would like to invoke the spirit of gratitude and appreciation as we recognize the incredible contributions of the dedicated staff, board members, and partners. Bless those in our state, federal, and county and city governments. Bless our non-affiliated volunteers and grassroots organizers who care enough to make the sacrifices needed to consistently show up <coughs> and offer stories or share a word. We are grateful for their tireless efforts to su and support of all the work that we do together to build a brighter, more equitable, and sustainable future for ourselves, our children, and our community. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. All right, let's start with Councillor Floyd, if we could go around the room and introduce ourselves, please. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Council Member Richie Floyd. I represent St. Petersburg's uh, City Council District 8. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Vice Mayor Patty Reed from the awesome city of Pinellas Park. Good afternoon. Council Member John Muhammad, City of St. Petersburg, District 7. Good afternoon, Brian Scott, uh, Pinellas County Commission, District 2. Good afternoon, <coughs> Julie ward Bajalski, Mayor of the Great City of Dunedin. David? Whit Blanton, Executive Director. Hello, Vice Mayor David Albright in the City of Clearwater. Dave Eggers, Pinellas County Commissioner. Hi, Eric Gerard, Vice Mayor of Largo. Gina Driscoll, St. Petersburg City Council, and here representing PSTA. Chris Burke, Vice Mayor of City of Seminole, representing the Inland Communities. Thank you, and I'm Janet Long, uh, Pinellas County Commissioner and Chair of Forward Pinellas. Um, <clears throat> Tina, are there any, or Maria, are there any members to be heard from the public today? Yes, Madam Chair, David Ballad Getters Jr. is here. All right, David. Please come forward. Good afternoon, David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live at 802 Georgia Avenue in Ann <coughs> Arbor. Is the automobile industry cooking the books, so to speak, falsifying its financial records and using our insurance premiums to finance their personal purchase of sewer revenue bonds? Is the automobile industry floating the money of our insurance premiums into various financial realms of infrastructure schemes while the government lollygags on its efforts to devise various ways of public transportation. 
Most of society will soon face the decision of letting go of their automobile due to financial constraints, and as windfall, such politically devised forms of busing system will be our only recourse for our public transportation needs. The automobile insurance industry is soon to lose over half of its customer revenue and is looking for ways to liquidate its existing income into other markets with a guaranteed rate of return. Has anyone done an in-depth audit of the insurance industry? As I suspect, the insurance industry is floating money and cooking their books, buying bonds using our insurance premiums, and as society continues to be impoverished, falling into despair, is legislation to soon to require that everyone who rides a bicycle to purchase bicycle insurance and perfidiously mandate that everyone that rides a bike to now have insurance coverage for the right to have the privilege of riding a bicycle is Fran Hash, the motorcycle attorney, also now soon to become a two-wheel bicycle attorney as well. It's funny how conveniently her area of expertise fits that mold. Our traffic issues, our roadway congestion, our gaudy busing concept is all by purposeful design in the aggregate of special interests, sinister motives, methods, and means circuitously engineered by villains plundering what they can while they can. Thank you. Anyone else, Tina? Yes, Vice Mayor Mike Eisner from Tarpon Springs. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, fellow council people, um, members. Um, when I started off as a commissioner in Tarpon Springs, uh, first of all, I'm Vice Mayor Mike Eisner from Tarpon Springs. Um, we received something, and I'm sure Whit Blanton would know, we got something that it was a uh, curricula put out by the Pinellas, Forward Pinellas. It was people live here, not cars. And uh, we were looking for zero deaths. And Vice Mayor at the time, Craig Lunt and myself, refused to sign it. Because when I looked it over, it didn't seem to, it wasn't something that can move things forward. It was a lot of facts, a lot of figures, but without any application. Now it's probably almost two years since that has been, because I'm a commissioner now, two years, it's even longer, four years. So I haven't seen that the driving here has become any safer. People are going faster. Uh, we get reports every single week that more and more people are being hit. Um, I don't see any budget or any LED lights being put in any of the school bus stops. Um, I have a great deal of uh, articles here of, you know, that we, uh, Governor DeSantis wants to move forward and he did pass something that we should have it done, uh, you know, earlier, or I should say later starts for the school. But in certain areas, East Lake Middle, uh, Pinellas High Invo, in in a invasion, Involvation, Bay Point Middle, um, have all started even earlier instead of later. Um, I have little parts of this that we've been doing this, I think, since 2018. Um, I just don't see any improvement. I don't see that we've put one light in anywhere. I, I also sit on the School Transportation Safety Board. Um, I've been speaking about this for about two years. And while speaking about it, uh, I finally get to the answer that we just don't have the money for it. And I'm hoping that this board could put the money towards uh, at least getting some where it's the darkest area. We need to do something. Um, there is a gentleman, well, he's no longer alive, who was struck, Ethan Weiser, um, when he was 15 years old. I sat at that meeting. I listened to his uncle and his dad tell that story. It's a heart-wrenching story, and I really don't want to hear any other stories like that. We do, we all get these stories of bicycles getting hit. Um, 
and we just need to do something. So I have all these highlights. I, I don't want to bore you with all the little excerpts that I highlighted, um, but we do need to do something to put money aside to get LED lights on at least the darkest ones. So if we can do that, I would appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Blessing. Thank you. Anybody else, Tina? No, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. Next, we are on the consent agenda. Are there any board members that wish to pull any items from the consent agenda? Madam Chair. Commissioner Eggers. I just wanted to make a comment that um, on our bicycle um, pedestrian advisory committee, we have a lot of vacancies on the at-large area. So if there's folks out there living anywhere in the county that have interests, we have quite a few vacancies on that. And then our citizen advisory committee, we uh, have done pretty well. We have uh, Largo has a vacancy and the beaches have a vacancy, but really on the, on the bicycle part, there's, there's openings for a lot of folks that are interested. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. What was the name of that committee again? Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory. Move, okay. appro move approval. Thanks. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of uh, passing the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 All right. And now we are on the public hearing items, transportation improvement plan. That's 5A. Chelsea. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, I do not have a formal presentation for this item, um, but the last couple of months we've been talking with you about our unified planning work program, which is the two-year budget that funds the transportation side of our agency. Because we're on a two-year cycle, we're coming up to the end of that right now, and the next UPWP will begin on July 1st. There is some funding left over in the budget that we have not yet spent. So at this point in time, every MPO has to make the decision as to whether they de-obligate those extra funds, which means we take them out of the budget and they come back to us on July 1st, or if we kind of let them sit there and then they come to us July 1st of 2025. So we've gone very closely through our budget and we have identified about $730,000 that we do not intend to spend between now and July 1st of this year. So we're looking to de-obligate those funds. And that is a very large sum of money. I know you're all probably thinking that. So there are a number of reasons that we have such a large amount of funding that we have not yet spent. Uh, one of them is we have been planning um, for months now to purchase a diff uh, um, additional uh, trail counting equipment for our, our trail system. A lot of the equipment that we purchased back in 2015 is starting to fail, and it's in dire need of replacement. Um, we've been going through some procurement issues uh, over the last couple of months that we, we think we finally cleaned up and we're j just about ready to move forward, um, but maybe not by July 1st. So we're going to de-obligate some of the funding that was intended for that program and then purchase the equipment after after July 1st. Another thing is the gateway, um, the gateway master plan, the implementation of that plan. Because we had some staff turnover, we weren't able to begin that work as quickly as we had expected. So now that we have some new staff on board, we're ready to move forward, but we won't get as much done before July 1st as we expected. So again, we're going to de-obligate some of that funding so we can pick right up on July 1st and hit the ground running. Also, with the Advantage Pinellas, the Long Range Transportation Plan, we've come under budget on a couple of tasks for that. So we had some additional funding that we're able to deobligate there as well. And then also we had budgeted to purchase some data um, that also there have been some del delays with. So we're looking to deobligate that funding. So it does seem like a lot of money, but we definitely have some plans uh, working with you all that we've prioritized some planning studies and implementation to work on that we plan to do starting on July 1st. So this action today will remove that money from the budget, make it available July 1st of 2024, and through that we have to amend the UPWP and also the Transportation Improvement Program so that the numbers align. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions? Commissioner Eggers? So, so de-obligating, does that free up the money for other people to use, other organizations to use this year? What's no, it the, does What's not. the point of doing it if we're going to have it available to us on July 1. So the point is, if we don't deobligate it before July 1st, uh, the Florida Department of Transportation and Federal Highway doesn't have time to be able to kind of take it out and then give it back to us. It gives them a couple of extra months to be able to process the paperwork on their end so that we get it July 1st. If we don't deobligate, we don't see that money until July 1st of 25. 
So it's a background kind of paperwork issue. Where are they? Uh, it's their the fault, most, yeah. That's the most bizarre thing I've ever heard. Anyway, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Quick question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so do we anticipate um, spending all that money in the next fiscal year then? So are, will we have any of these funds that we'll have to deobligate de at this point next year to move, move so ahead? Be or? Because the UPWP is a two-year document, next year if we don't spend any money, we just keep it through the second year. The deobligation only comes up every two years. Um, but we will be bringing you the final uh, Unified Planning Work Program, which is our budget next month, I believe. And that has an outline of how we intend to spend those funds. And we do have plans for them all. Thanks. You're welcome. Anyone else? Um, then moved by Commissioner Scott. Do we have a second? Second by Gina Diskell. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Madam Chair, for the record, there were no citizens wishing to be heard during that public hearing. Thank you. And um, for the record, I think it's important to let everybody know that we do have Secretary Gwynn here in the, in the room today. So if anybody has any further questions on any of these issues, I'm sure he'd be happy to help us clarify. Is that okay with you, Mr. Secretary? All right. Uh, moving on, we are on uh, now the PSTA activities report. Who is doing that today? Is that Gina? Do you have it? Yes, I do. Um, the PSTA board met on March 27th, 2024. The board approved the FY23 audit which was given a clean opinion on the financial statements <clears throat> for PSTA. The board also approved a project management and construction management contract with Skanska and HDR to provide project management assistance for various uh, PSTA capital projects, including, but not limited to, the new Sunrunner station, um, also solar panel installation and fiber connection to PSTA. The board received an informational presentation on the Clearwater Transit Center, which is um, um, a, a major success that we're celebrating right now. Uh, we talked about the need for the facility, the design evolution, and next steps now that the land swap with the city of Clearwater has been finalized. The board also received a report on development that is occurring along the Sunrunner Corridor. Um, it's being tracked by a group called St. Pete Rising. The corridor has seen residential, hotel, and commercial development um, all together valued at $9.4 million. And they're just getting started. Um, also, the... Um, Oh, so that was it. We have our next board meeting on April 24th at 9 a.m. And that was it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions? Yes, David. I just wanted to add that we have a celebration for the Intermodal Center that's going to take place on Monday, April the 15th at 10 a.m. If you all want to come. Uh, it's going to be at the uh, site on the corner of Myrtle and Court Street. Excellent. And now we are on, oh, so we need to vote on this, right? No? no. no? All right. The Regional Activities Report, Item 6B. I'll cover that again today. Um, good afternoon, board members. Uh, just a quick update, the TMA leadership group serving Pasco, Pinellas, and Hillsborough County met back on February 16th and had a pretty good discussion, uh, which I've shared with the board at your March meeting, on the role of the um, regional transportation providers um, in a future MPO um, voting member structure. Uh, and specifically, we talked about the Tampa Bay uh, uh, Aviation Authority or, or Tampa Bay International Airport or Tampa International Airport and the Port Tampa Bay, which is our major port 
and the desire um, or consensus generally among all those at the meeting to acknowledge that those representatives should be considered regional, should not come out of the Hillsborough County allocation uh, for uh, voting membership, provided that those members are staff people and not elected officials, and there was general consensus about that. Uh, there was some discussion that uh, the boards that um, govern those two authorities are not comprised of regional representatives and are um, solely Hillsborough County elected officials uh, or gubernatorial appointees. So there should be some consideration given to uh, reviewing the board structure if they are um, allowed to be part of the voting structure as staff on the regional MPO. Should we go down that path? The agenda packet in, contains a memo uh, from Hillsborough TPO staff uh, outlining um, those considerations. And it also answers some questions that were raised about the amount of funding that Hillsborough County and other local government partners provide to the airport and to Port Tampa Bay, uh, because there was some concern or question that that might obligate others to participate in that funding that they were added to that board. So this is a topic we can continue to discuss, and um, as we explore these other um, components of regional voting structure for the MPO, but I wanted you to have this information since it was shared with us. I also want to let you know that um, our next meeting is May 17th of the TMA Leadership Group, and we will be meeting to discuss the role of the uh, public transit providers, uh, Hillsborough uh, Area Regional Transit and PSTA here in our county, as well as Go Pasco in, in Pasco County, and taking up a few other items related to the merger. So it's an ongoing conversation, and um, that discussion will continue on May 17th. If you have any other questions for me, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Any questions from for Whit on this issue? Any? Uh, Whit, I have a thought or a question. I'm not sure what, where it falls, but do you think there might be value in having someone like the executive director from our own airport come and talk to this board about the unbelievable amount of growth over there? Because it's definitely going to affect that corridor going by the airport. The ridership on Allegiant, for example, is out of sight in terms of what it has been. And they are uh, in the process of bringing some brand new, uh, big, huge jets to that airport that have not heretofore been, been there. Mm -hmm. And I think it might be of us all to hear a little bit more about what's going on over there. So just as that growth begins to really seriously impact our roads, that we would know about it. I think that's um, a great idea. Commissioner Scott? Um, yeah, that's an excellent uh, point. And right now, uh, PI is accommodating about 2.5 million passengers per year. And with the, um, with the renovations and growth that they're expecting, they're s expecting that to go to 3.5 million passengers per year. So that's pretty significant when we already have about 15 million visitors that are on our roadways already. So that's going to be another si significant impact. And, and speaking to that point, Commissioner, it also causes me to say when we talk about the word regionalism and how we've been working so hard on regionalizing our MPO, for example, I don't know why we wouldn't think of PI as part of that discussion because they carry passengers that end up going north into Pasco, south into Manatee, and over to Hillsborough County, mm -hmm. because for some of the places that they service, uh, Tampa mm -hmm. International doesn't necessarily carry passengers there. So anyway, I just thought it was something that we ought to keep our fingers on the pulse of. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, um, and <clears throat> I think the discussion uh, at this point on the regional MPO is 25 members. So. It's those two regional components um, really are, like you said, off the top, so to speak, and the remaining 23 would be split between the three counties. One of our choices, one of Pinellas County's choices, could actually be somebody, I guess, from the airport. 
Um, that would be part of our allocation. The thing about Tampa International, it gets no money from Hillsborough County, as you saw in the, in the uh, letter, so it's truly a regional without influence, excessive influence. And the port is so minor that it's, it's virtually the same. So I think the idea of those being split out separately is probably st still okay. I think conceptually everybody was on board with that. Our airport, on the other hand, is definitely ours. I mean, it, it couldn't be separate. So it, but it could be one of our choice, one of our, if, if we had, end up with six or seven representatives, right? So that would be a choice for later. I think that's a uh, that's an interesting discussion. The, the Board of County Commissioners oversees the airport, so theoretically you're already representing the airport as a county commission, but um, maybe there's a role for staff to play uh, that's more explicit, and we can certainly talk about that. That's a good point. Okay, so are we good? Yep, I think so. Okay. Item D is the Pinellas Planning Council. C. We're on C. Oh, we're on C. Okay, uh, Alexis, where are you? I'll introduce Alexis as she's coming up. Um, every year we like to uh, have a little bit of a, of a highlight of our internship uh, program that we have with the University of South Florida Masters of Urban Regional Planning Program. It's a fellowship program that we're proud to sponsor. I believe this is, Rodney, our fourth or fifth year that we've done this program? Five, so this is our fifth year. And Alexis uh, has been with us since August, I believe. So um, thank you for being here and go ahead and take it away. And um, yeah, Good afternoon, board members. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you guys about this internship. It's been so beneficial, I think, in ways I can't even describe. Um, so a little bit more background, I moved here from Queens, New York, not really knowing what a planner did or what a planner, um, I guess like what a planner was. And I really got to learn it, it's an art. Um, one thing, it's, they make it look really easy. Um, but without further ado, let's get into the presentation. So the first project I got to work on was the Advantage Alternate 19 story map. This story map consisted of basically all of the um, important information. I kind of was summarizing the key points of Alt 19. Um, and it's currently live on our website. And honestly, the highlight of this project was really getting to attend the local government meetings and learning how that process works and seeing how planners, I guess, interact with consultants, um, government officials, local governments, as well as partners. So it was really exciting to kind of learn that. And I think that gave me a really good foundation for how planners work. Uh, the next piece is the bicycle parking code comparison. This was definitely my favorite because um, I really got to just research. I realized I love researching, especially about um, bicycle parking. Um, so I really got the opportunity to kind of look across the country and analyze each code and kind of see what are the differences, what are the key elements that could be beneficial for Pinellas or even just any other county. Um, it was really beneficial. Um, and then I curated the highlights and presented them to the PAC and the, the BPAC as well. Um, I definitely had some hiccups with presenting, but I'm really grateful to have learned from my mistakes, and I think that's honestly the only way you can get better. Um, and yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed this work, and it was really nice to kind of piece everything together. Um, so after I completed the analysis, I then curated a knowledge exchange series that is live on our website, and the highlight of this was making a big spreadsheet with all of the different codes. Um, I got to use Municode, which is a really important tool, and I really enjoyed it. I got to really piece everything together and kind of see the whole process going through. And then I worked on wayfinding signage. Um, I pointed about 15 points along the Pinellas Trail that would serve as good spots to add wayfinding signs. Um, and as you can see, these are examples from Cambridge and Boulder, Colorado, I believe. And I really like these signs because they also have bike parking along with their signage. Um, so I thought those were super cool to add. Now let's move on to the transit corridor analysis. Um, so essentially, Jared took the time out of his day to teach me GIS, which I really applaud him for because it, took, it takes a lot of patience to teach someone this stuff. And honestly, it was really fun. I got to really learn how to really bring data to life. So basically, I identified um, redevelopment potential along major investment corridors in Pinellas County that, would, um, that were also part of the LRTP. And I got to really bring them to life and make 3D maps. This was super interesting for me because I've never really made a map before, let alone a 3D one. So I really enjoyed making this. And um, shout out to Jared, because this, again, is like super cool stuff. Here are some of the maps I got to make. Oh, let me go back. I made 2D and 3D, and I kind of put them next to each other as well. 
And overall, now I'm just going to kind of go off script really, is like I got to learn way more than I could have in a class. I think, you know, a class in a Google definition of planners can really only teach you so much. And I really got to see hands on like what a planner does and the art of it all. And it's super hard and I just really enjoy learning it. Um, and I'm really grateful to have made such great connections here as well. I think gaining that hands on experience is really going to better me in the planning world. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to pursue transportation planning in the future. Thank you so much. Now hang around if anyone has any questions or anything. All right. Quest questions, concerns, comments? Commissioner Eggers. Well, I think it's awesome um, that you did this and that you've fallen in love with this profession and um, get a chance to pursue it uh, professionally down the road. I, some of the 3D stuff is just, just mind boggling, but I think it'll be a great tool for yeah. us uh, down the road. And with your bicycle parking analysis was, I mean, quite detailed, but um, very informative and helpful as well. It'd be interesting to see if you did something like that on golf cart parking, because <laughs> <laughs> what, what a disaster that is. Trying to find parking places for those and not taking up the big parking, you know, all of that stuff. But um, thank you for that. And, um, and then also on the, on the trail, the, the, all of the work that you did on the trail. That, to me, that's still a challenge because of all the changing technologies, the changing uses, and therefore, how do we coexist? It's, it's almost being the walkers, the older, frail walkers are almost being pushed off the trail. So a um, lot of work to do. So folks like yourself in the future will help us with those solutions. And good luck to you. I appreciate that. In your venture. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Driscoll. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation. It was fantastic. I'm just kind of wondering what what your favorite part was? Oh man, that's kind of hard, but um, for me, uh, the bicycle parking was probably my favorite because mm -hmm. it really gave me an opportunity to kind of just really do research, which is something I didn't, if you would have asked me two years ago if I would have loved research, I probably would have looked at you crazy. Um, but it, I just really enjoyed that part and getting to compare each code. But also, I grew up in Maryland where they didn't have bicycle parking, let alone bike lanes, and there were a lot of um, accidents where I grew up because it was pretty rural where I lived. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of really inspired me to is just kind of be a part of the change to make, I don't know, Pinellas County more bike friendly. So I yeah. that a lot. And do you own a bicycle yourself? Yeah, I, mean, I have two. Yeah. <laughs> I want like five, it's so bad. <laughs> well, the, just having that insight and then looking at ways that you can use your own experience plus your education and, and um, this experience to really, cre you know, take a step towards being a real change maker in that space. Yeah, definitely. So there are just so many different things about this work, and I always admire um, all of our planners that, that work so hard on this stuff. I was curious to see what your favorite was since you got to try a little of everything. I think that's oh. one thing I was really grateful for, to be able to try everything, because yeah. I was like, I really didn't know what kind of planner I wanted to be, and there's so many different realms of planning. So I think this intern, um, internship really gave me a chance to kind of explore all of it, and yeah, it's it's super cool stuff. I agree with you. Good. Well, thank you again, and I hope we can count on your input as we move forward with making various decisions here now that you've had a taste of it. Yeah, definitely. All right, wishing you all the best. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, Mayor Wojcicki. Thank you. I have no smart question other than where in Maryland did you grow up? I grew up around the Deal area, like probably like 25 minutes south of Annapolis and in Arundel County. Um, not much going on there. I'm from Prince George's County. Oh my God, small yeah, world. That's why I asked. That's so cool. <laughs> Anyone else? Councilor Gerard. So congratulations, Lexis. And it's, um, it makes me so happy to see that the work you did is meaningful and has impact and is actually being used rather than just being assigned a bunch of busy work to keep you out of everyone's hair. That's, that's, <laughs> a, a, that's a great part about the internship here. Uh, my question is what are next steps? Where are you going? What are you going to do? What are your plans now that you're, now that you're leaving us? Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in the summer, uh, around the end of May, I'm accepting 
an internship position with HNTV, so I'm transitioning to the private sector um, to kind of get a taste for, I guess, both worlds of planning and to really understand as a consultant. Um, so those are my next steps, which I'm excited for. It's going to be a new chapter. Thank you. I appreciate that. Anyone else? I'll just say thank you again, and that uh, we like the internship program because not only do we want to make sure the intern benefits from being here with us, and it sounds like you did, Definitely. but we benefit, and uh, not just in getting a bunch of work done cheaply, but uh, <laughs> oh, it, that is a big one. it's your perspective. <laughs> uh, we do pay our interns, uh, but it's your perspective and your infectious enthusiasm, and I think we should all reflect on that level of excitement that you shared about the work that you went on. and. I want to get back to that excitement. So um, <laughs> thank you for, for, for doing that, and thank you for grounding us. Appreciate, Appreciate that. Thank you. Wonderful. Was well, nice. To <laughs> thank you, guys. <laughs> Good luck to you, Alexis. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, now moving on to uh, 6D is the PPC and the MPO annual audit, and a presentation from Julie Davis. Hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Julie Davis. I am a shareholder with Rivera Gordimer and Company, and we are here today to go over the results of your independent audit for fiscal year 2023. I do want to say thanks for having us back. It's our first year back under a new contract, and we really appreciate to be able to work with you all again. We really got started on the audit process back in December for the Planning Council side and in January for the MPO. Um, part of our original plan was to be here at this meeting to go over final results with you all, so I'm very pleased to say that we've, we are here on schedule for that. I also want to take a moment to thank Rebecca, Margie, and Chris for all of their hard work and effort during the audit process. It's a lot of hard work and effort to provide us everything we need, not only for one audit, but for two audits um, throughout the entire audit process on top of their normal day-to-day -day duties. So I just really like to commend staff for all of their hard work and effort. So I'm going to go through a presentation. This is just a highlight of our audit results, as well as a highlight of the financial statements. Um, the information is summarized for both audits, both the Planning Council and the MPO, as we walk through this. So first and foremost, our opinion on your financial statements are clean opinions or unmodified opinions, which means that anybody who needs to rely upon your financial statements to make an informed decision can do that and know that they are materially stated. As I mentioned, we had full cooperation from the entire management team. We had full access to the book of, books and records, and we had no disagreements over any accounting matters. Our responsibilities are under first and foremost generally accepted auditing standards, which means that our objective is to provide reasonable and not absolute assurance that your financial statements are free of material misstatement. And what that means is that we don't look at every single transaction throughout the year. We use a risk-based auditing approach and we use sampling and materiality to um, determine our audit procedures and render our opinion on your financial statements. Moving on, our responsibilities are also under government auditing standards, which is where we look at compliance with laws and rules and contracts, and we're pleased to report we had no um, compliance findings to report to you all today. And additionally, we did have responsibilities under the uniform guidance for the MPO. This is where we really dive into those federal funds that come through and look at individual specific grant agreements. Um, this year, we really looked at the highway planning contract, which is about 1.6 million out of the 2 million federal funds that flowed through the MPO this year. In our opinion on that financial statement, when we're really diving into the details of the compliance attributes of that, it was a clean opinion and no findings on that as well. And then we also look at internal accounting controls. So we look at those internal controls, the extent necessary to render our opinion. We do spend some time looking at the payroll and the disbursements process for both organizations. We look at grant compliance, segregation of duties, financial reporting, and some other key financial areas when we're doing that. And we're pleased to report we had no internal control matters to report to you all today as well. Moving on is just some required communications. So judgments and estimates are inherent in every single financial statement. These are just the significant ones that we've identified in your financials. They include the allowance for doubtful accounts, the actuarial assumptions related to FRS and OPEB, as well as the fair value of investments held. And we concluded they were all reasonable in the circumstances. And then other matters. Um, you've heard me say we had no matters to report to you all. And please report on this page. We have no matters to report to you all. Um, this is always the fun page. If we had anything of significance, you would have had phone calls and meetings prior to this. Um, so I'm pleased to report there were no illegal acts or fraud noted in, during our audit process. 
Um, there was a new accounting standard that was adopted this year, GASB 96, which is subscription-based IT arrangements, and this had no impact on the financial statements. There was a journal entry related to the pension-related entries. This is expected every year, just based on the timing of when we get started on the audit and the release of that information, both from the county and from the state. Um, and so we always assist with those journal entries. And then we had no findings or other matters to report to you all. So next up is a summary and a highlight of the financial statements. I'm going to turn it over to Elise Leach. She's a supervisor in our office who assisted on the audit to go over a highlight of the numbers for you. Thank you, Julie. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Elise Leach, and I'm an audit supervisor with Rivera Gordimer, and I'm going to briefly go over the financial statements with you guys. So starting with the statement of net position, total assets for the planning council ended at 2.4 million this year, up from about 1.8 million last year. This increase is a result of an increase in cash in AR um, due to increased revenues this year, uh, which are offset by a decrease in capital assets, which is due to annual um, accumulated depreciation. Deflow Deferred outflows of resources relates to the participation in the FRS pension plan, as well as the county's OPEB plan. And there's a decrease this year, ending at 601,000. Total liabilities were down slightly this year to about 3.47 million from 3.6 million last year. The changes are due to an increase in compensated absences, as well as the FRS pension liability which are offset by de uh, decreases in the OPEB liability as well as the lease payments due to, or the lease liability due to current year payments. Deferred inflows of resources also relate to the FRS and OPEB pension plans, which are down um, to 1.6 million this year. These changes lead to an overall net deficit of just over 2 million, which is an improvement of 737 from last year. It's important to note that these financial statements are presented on a government-wide basis, which include long-term assets and liabilities. If we were to look at just fund balance of the general fund, you would see, it, or it would paint a better picture of the planning council's financial statements um, because it includes long-term liabilities as well as the OPEB and pension activity. If we were just to look at the general fund, you would see that fund balance would end at just about 1.8 million, of which all is considered unrestricted and available for expenditures. This equates to just over six million or six months worth of expenditures based on last year's activities, which we would consider um, a healthy fund balance. With all that, we'll scooch over to the MPO. Um, total assets this year ended at 1.4 million, down slightly from last year of about 1.7 million, mainly due to lower AR um, as it relates to lower revenues this year. Total liabilities are consistent with prior year and the liabilities, which are just AP, essentially due to the planning council. Overall net position of the MPO ended at 856,000, down from last year by about 248,000. And then moving on to the next page. For the Planning Council, total revenues increased over prior year by about, or just a little under 1.3 million uh, due to increases in program revenue and property taxes. Program revenues increased uh, just themselves by 349,000 due to additional services provided to the MPO, as well as ongoing safety projects. Property tax revenues increased by 832,000 due to increases in the millage rate. Program expenses also increased by 675,000, mainly related to salaries and benefits, as well as ongoing projects and safety studies leading us to an increase in net position of 737,000. For the MPO, total revenues decreased by just a little under 200,000, mainly due to the contracts with uh, grants ending in 2022. Program expenses increased just about 67,000, which leads us to a decrease in net position of 248,000. And with that, are there any questions for the financial statements? Board? Questions? Thoughts? Concerns? 
Anything? No? Good? Happy that we have more of these. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to just take a minute to thank you all and thank our staff. Uh, we rarely have our accounting finance staff in the room. Uh, Margie and uh, Chris, if you could just stand, and I know you don't love the spotlight, but these ladies do a great job behind the scenes to make sure we're in compliance. <laughs> it's two thirds of our finance staff, uh, but thank you all very much. Uh, Margie is handling the PPC side of things and Chris works on the MPO side. Nice, very good. Nice to know we have such competent people working with us. You've got an excellent team here. We think so. And compared too. to when I was a consultant, I always like to make recommendations that are, you know, here's what you need to be doing. And it's nice to hear recommendations of you don't need to do anything, you're good. We don't have anything to report. So, right. thank you. Although, I could. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I could make an argument there's always something if you look hard enough. There's always something. Cause you to be better. Anyway, ladies, thank you. Okay. Uh, Madam item, Chair? Yes, ma'am. That um, item is an action item, but there are no members of the public wishing to speak on the audit item, but we do require a motion, a second, and a vote. Okay. So All right. Dan. Who made the motion, though? David Albritton. David, and the second is from Eric? Eric. Yeah. Perfect. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Now we have. Now we have uh, Rodney. Uh, good afternoon, uh, commissioners and board members. Uh, Rodney Chapman, division manager here at Fort Pinellas. Um, today, I'll spend a few minutes giving you a brief update on where we are with the fiscal year 25 uh, PPC budget. This is a follow-up to some of the information I shared with you at our February uh, board workshop. At that time. I let the board know that things are a little bit different this budget cycle. Uh, we, as, as I said at the time, we get our guidance from the Office of Management and Budget, as well as the county administrator. And for this year, uh, we are being asked to submit a flat budget, which uh, means that you submit a budget that is at the same funding level as fiscal year 24. Uh, there were a couple of caveats, and you see there, uh, those there noted at the uh, second half of the screen in that um, the flat budget would absorb any career path increases, any increases in Florida retirement system payments, as well as any cost allocations. Uh, OMB was also uh, keen to note that the flat budget does not absorb any general salary increase or any increase in health care costs. So the information that I provided to you in your backup is reflective of those uh, things. So uh, we uh, worked with OMB and county administration to meet uh, those requirements. So we did submit a flat budget and stress tests uh, to uh, the county um, and reviewed those documents with the county administrator last week. Uh, one uh, thing to note with what we're proposing at this time is that there would be no new projects or initiatives in fiscal year 25. A little bit more on the stress tests. So uh, working with OMB, uh, we were able to calculate the three and 5% targets. And the 3% target is uh, about $127,000 and the 5% target was uh, about a $211,000 reduction. Again, these were hypothetical reductions in expenses and are not included in the draft budget at this time. Um, we did a couple of things to meet those spending reduction targets. Uh, the first uh, was to uh, reduce some of our personnel costs. Uh, OMB gave us guidance on calculating what is technically called a personnel lap savings. It's basically where you are looking at your uh, past three years of personnel costs uh, on the actuals, not what you budgeted, but what you actually spent. And um, determining if you could reduce your personnel costs pay your staff, meet your other requirements and buy at a reduced funding level, and working with them, we were able to uh, calculate a little under $200,000 in savings using that uh, methodology. Uh, to meet the 5% target, we took those lap savings and then added uh, some reductions in costs that we budget for legal advertising. So as you know, we are required to uh, place an ad in the Tampa Bay Times for our countywide uh, plan map amendments. Uh, so we've been able to 
calculate that we could uh, reduce that number in the 23 or 24% uh, figure. And then uh, we also uh, eliminated any funding that we would budget for board activities. Uh, some of you may recall who have been around for a while that we have uh, used board activities uh, to fund things like the peer exchange. Uh, some of you went on to uh, Indianapolis. Uh, we have also used that line item to pay for things like the legislative forum that we had uh, a few years back, as well as any other forward-facing uh, board-involved activities. Um, after meeting with the county administrator last week, he gave us uh, some more homework. Um, and one of the things that we have been asked to do is to work with him and his team on giving the Board of County Commissioners other options to reduce our budgets. And so uh, the, uh, the mission is to come up with a uh, target or goal for our millage rate as well as our reserves. As you may recall, our millage rate stands right now at 0.0210 mils. And our reserves are estimated to be about $2.9 million. Um, but that $2.9 million isn't really a solid number uh, at the moment because it doesn't include uh, a few things that are going to be added in at a later date. Um, so for example, SARI increases aren't included in the numbers that I'll share with you on the subsequent slide. Uh, healthcare cost increases haven't been factored in. Um, and there's some other details that will be further clarified when I come back to you in June. One of the things we also share with the county administrator uh, is that given the future actions that are going to be required for the MPO merger, we feel like we need to have a healthy reserve to potentially respond or contribute to some of the stand-up costs or startup costs for the, the MPO merger. Uh, so. Um, Again, having a healthier reserve uh, gives us uh, a greater ability to carry out the mission uh, for Pinellas. So just again, a snapshot, these numbers are going to change between now and then June when we get the first uh, property appraiser data and then in July when we get the final estimates. But um, we can see here uh, some of the figures I just mentioned. So. Um, the FY24 budget numbers are here for on revenue side, and then 25 is here. You see the 2.9 estimate, but again, it doesn't include some other things that are going to be added to, uh, to the expense side. But looking at about $2.6 in uh, Avalorum taxes, a small amount for technical assistance, uh, the MPO, uh, grant revenues, interest, and, and the total there. Um, and then this is what the expense side looks like, uh, a little more than $2.5 million on personnel uh, operating it has been reduced. Um, and then, the, again, the reserves and the $2.9 million there, and then our 18 uh, full-time equivalent staff. Rodney, while you're on that slide, yeah. isn't it true that our constitutional officer transfers, that's an estimate at this point? Yes, it's an estimate, and uh, what's also an estimate that's in the, the budget spreadsheet is uh, the cost allocation charges. So you hear me talk about that every year for the last seven years. And those numbers are, have not been finalized yet, so what is in the budget is uh, last year's numbers, which are really just a placeholder, so that those numbers will change as well. Uh, so the next steps, uh, we'll continue to work with OMB and the county administrator to develop uh, military and uh, reserve targets that I mentioned to you. Uh, we are scheduled to have a budget information session with the commission in June. Uh, we'll bring a draft of the fiscal year 25 budget back to uh, this board in, uh, later that month as well. Uh, we'll ask for uh, official action on the millage rate and the budget in July, and then the commission, the county commission will, will act on the budget at uh, two hearings in September. So are there any questions? Before the board asks questions, I have uh, one thing I'd like to add. Rodney talked about the 2.9 million estimate in, re in uh, reserves or unassigned fund balance. Uh, that's, also, that's kind of a working capital fund is the way we look at it. It's not really an operating expense. Um, and we could, we could pay that down faster if we had additional staff, for instance, but then we'd really burn through that quickly. Um, it's a good source of uh, grant um, local match because that is local revenues, 
And in some cases, for instance, the Safe Streets for All grant um, that we are considering pursuing at the federal um, level, there's currently a notice of funding availability to update our Safe Streets Pinellas plan uh, that Commissioner Eisner referenced earlier. It's been four years, we're looking to update that. We can use that reserve to meet our uh, federal match without having to go to the cities of Largo and the county and cobbling together the local match. So it's an important working capital for an agency like ours that does go after significant amounts of grants. Um, it also um, could complement the merger costs. Um, the Florida Department of Transportation has generously offered to help us with any merger costs um, up to a certain amount. Um, but we don't know what those are going to be, and we might need to match that as well. So there's a lot of uncertainty over the next couple of years that just wanted to highlight why that unassigned fund balance is where it is. Anything from any of the board members? Questions, concerns, thoughts? Anything? No? You guys are awfully quiet today. Yeah, but still. All right. How about our active transportation plan? All right. We've got a, a few people uh, who are going to present on this item. Just a US 19's next. Oh, okay. All right. So I think we have Brian. Are you going to cover this item? Okay. I'm going to give a little bit of background as you're walking up to the podium. So starting in about 2016, uh, we started asking the Florida Department of Transportation District 7 about the next step of US 19 beyond the current project that is uh, widening and improving safety from State Road 580 and Dunedin all the way up through Curlew Road where we're building an interchange at Curlew Road. Uh, we are looking to put another interchange at Tampa Road uh, north of Curlew. But we've always kind of had this back and forth with the department about what's really the right um, uh, types of improvements for US-19 beyond that as you are adjacent to uh, Lake Tarpon going up into the Pasco County line. And the department's been responsive. They've addressed our questions. They've addressed our concerns. And uh, thankfully, they're helping us by looking at some different alternatives. So uh, with that segue, Brian, take it away, please. All right. Well, now I have to recalculate what I was going to say, because that was going to be the first part of it. But uh, yeah. so as Whit said, we had our, our 1990 PD&E study went all the way from Gandy all the way to north of Alternate 19, the Pasco County line, and it recommended interchanges at the major roads. So north of uh, Nebraska Avenue, we had Alderman, Klosterman, Tarpon, and Alternate 19 that would have a interchange at them. And so like what said, we were asked to, you know, take a different look north of uh, Nebraska and see what other options were there. The first thing that we looked at were some innovative interchanges. And those really take, for the most part, they take your left turns out of the intersection. You either do it beforehand, create another kind of like, like a, another parallel road that you take the left turns out, let them get out of the main intersection and increases your uh, free flow through that intersection or you do it after the intersection where you create an opportunity for them to hang a U-turn and then come back and make a right. So we looked at those and the right-of-way costs were pretty uh, high in this corridor. As you know, it's very commercial and developed up there and the operations didn't really make sense either. So the MPO, we, start, we talked with them about what we found and they asked us to look at some additional alternatives. And so we started thinking about um, a viaduct option north of Nebraska to the alternate 19 area. And so that viaduct option would look kind of like the uh, Selman on Gandy, this new Selman extension. It's very visually permeable underneath it. And when we looked at that, if you didn't have any ramps um, in between Nebraska and alternate 19, you still needed four lanes in each direction at grade. But if you kept the ramps very similar to the interchange uh, concepts that we had, and air, ramps in those areas, we could get to where we needed two lanes at grade and the remainder of that through traffic, we could move to an elevated uh, structure and allow those front, those um, at grade roads to have some more pedestrian accommodations as well as some traffic calming on them. And so what we're in the process right now of doing is we are updating the cost estimates and concepts 
to show what that would look like so that we can have conversations with the MPO committees. We'll be back to talk to the board and that will actually be Jason Dolvik that is on your, uh, your agenda. He'll be here to talk with you all about that. And then also talk with the community, the businesses that are along the road, the cities and um, you know all of our stakeholders to see what they would like to see out there in the best way that we can accommodate that traffic that we know we need to do something to improve. We just don't know what that is yet. And so we're going to be in the process um, starting, I think this month we are starting the presentations to the committees. And so by then we'll have updated cost estimates and uh, visual concepts for everybody to look at so they can see what we're kind of talking about and what the options are. But we wanted to come and make sure that you all were aware that we were starting to have those conversations and also give you a little bit of time to think about what you would like to see before we come back to do that presentation to the MPO board. And so those are our next steps. You'll see us relatively shortly. I'm not certain, is it next month or is it after that with that we'll be back to talk with the... I think if we can do it in May and, and give a little bit of visual of what we're taking to the committees, I think that would help. I don't mind having a little more communication on this one than less. All right. So, uh, so we'll see you all next month and give you a visual of what these concepts can look like and you know, show some of the, the positives and the negatives of each one. And that way we can get your feedback as well. But I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Uh, Commissioner Eggers and then Commissioner Gerard. <clears throat> well, I'm glad to hear that you're going to bring some visuals back so that um, we can start showing it around. Um, we've been talking a little bit about how long it takes from idea to design, you know, and then yeah. design to construction, and then obviously the construction phase, and so many variables change along the way. Yeah. I would be interested also in hearing maybe the, maybe the good, the bad, and the ugly that you've heard um, on the one over in Tampa, um, because I know there was a lot of pushback originally. It happened anyway, and, you know, they push back on our roundabout on Alt 19. That, that's a simple little thing, but and it's working beautifully. Yeah. So maybe there was some of that over in Tampa as well, but it'd be nice to see what kind of after, after the thing has been in place, some of the good things that have happened, bad, and maybe some ugly things. Absolutely. I will make sure that we bring that information back to you. Appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Gerard. Well, Commissioner Eggers, I can tell you that I drive that, uh, that viaduct in Tampa down Gandhi every time we go to a Lightning game, and it's a lifesaver. So the only thing is I wish they would have had two lanes in each direction instead of one, but it's, it's, uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And, uh, but my question is very simple. What is the distance from Nebraska to Alt-19 up there? 7.5 miles. And are you leaning toward the viaduct idea? I don't think we have a, a preference. That's really one of those things that will take input from everybody that's going to be impacted by the project so that we can then make a decision on what the, uh, the solution out there is. Okay. Thanks. I, I just wanted to talk about the, the, the comment uh, from, from uh, Commissioner Gerard about the, the beauty of it. And I, I can imagine that going to and from is beautiful and that's something that has to be considered as well um, we're doing 118th kind of a similar above grade and it's going through it a purely I want to say purely as soon as I say that it's not going to be the case but in, you know industrial commercial area most of this area is commercial too but it's there's so much residential just a stone's throw away I don't know what they're gonna say about the beauty of it as far as the visual I don't know it'll be interesting to see how it really looks and how it lays out for the folks that live there as well. So we, obviously for moving traffic, I think it'll be a good thing, uh, but I think we have a long way to go, so. Well, the lighting on the viaduct in Tampa yeah. is actually very innovative and it really makes it into an attractive, yeah, an attractive showpiece. That would be nice does. if it does that. Yeah. So, thank you. I think with the uh, Tampa Viaduct over Gandhi, um, they raised the profile to, I think, 30 feet, if, if I'm not mistaken, which is a good bit higher than what they would have required um, to, have been, to do. And that allowed a lot more light, a lot more landscaping, and a lot more things like that underneath. And one of the things that 
uh, we'd be interested in hearing from the community about is do you see any desire or interest in activating the space underneath US 19 for um, sports, recreation, anything like that? You know, you can debate whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, but it is creating public space. And uh, Orlando is doing something like that underneath the I-4 as part of the Ultimate I-4 project. Uh, the state elevated that roadway. It's always been a barrier between the Paramore neighborhood and downtown, and they envisioned this under I area um, as a way to bring those communities together. And it's what you walk under when you go to the Orlando Arena for a basketball game or when you go back to Church Street Station. And it's not as dark and intimidating as it used to be uh, as somebody who grew up in that area. So it's something we could look at. Um, we're not sure we're going to put pickleball courts out there, but um, we'll see what the public wants to um, imagine with us. And your point about it taking so long, it really does. We've got another five years left on construction for the project that's underway. This will hopefully come not long after that. The good news is it's on the strategic intermodal system, so we are in line for um, a little more revenue stream coming to US-19. I, I, I'm having everything I can do to add to that comment. But I'm... Which one? Which comment? About how long Pick. it takes to oh. Well, we're, we're nicely positioned. Okay, I have to say it. We're, we're nicely positioned if the state legislature will stay out of our business. Yeah. Well, well I, but I will. But I will say, and I, I'm I'm with you on some of that stuff too. But they have been a a pretty strong, committed group to um, highway construction. And the budget for that, if I'm not mistaken, has grown pretty significantly over the last three or four years, not just locally, but really around the state. So that part of it, just keep doing it, um, you know, more and more funds for that. So, yeah, well, that, I'm not talking about transit. I'm talking about transportation or roads. It's transportation. Uh, roads, I agree with. But, you see that, yeah. Secretary Gwynn? Isn't that great? Could I, could I just ask one clarification on the... Uh, like, let's say there was no ramps, you know, that's the one extreme from yes, sir. the other. Are you saying that more lanes would be required underneath to transmit the traffic? If there yes. were ramps, people would get up on there and relieve the pressure down below? Yeah. A fewer, ramp, a fewer lanes? Yeah, so what we saw was we did a traffic analysis, and so people tend to use US-19 for two reasons, either for local trips or the longer commuting trips. And so when you remove the, the longer commuting trips, you still had all of those local trips, even if it was a longer two, three mile run, they had to stay at grade. And so if you give them an option to get up, they can go you know, one, two major streets down and then get down. And it's quicker for them and it also relieves some of that pressure on the at grade frontage road system. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. I wanted to just let the board know that we do have a meeting scheduled with the Tarpon Springs uh, Commission uh, on May 28th. So we're going to start having the conversation with them. We're also going to look to set um, a public workshop in the uh, Palm Harbor area to invite the business community and residents to review the visuals, talk to us about that as well. That'll probably be in June or so. Um, so the conversation's getting started, just FYI. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm here to talk to you about the Long Range Transportation Plan. Oh. I can't wait. I know, you've been waiting all day for this, I know. Um, <laughs> So this is one of kind of a three-part presentation. Um, this really just underscores the importance of Advantage Pinellas, which is your long-range transportation plan. Putting one together takes a whole lot of work, and we have pretty much everyone on staff doing some small part of it. So I'm just here to kind of give you an overview of the plan and the context. As you all know, we are the most densely populated county in the state, I think by a factor of two. We are really in a redevelopment mode. And we're expecting to add 120,000 new residents and 80,000 new jobs between now and 2050. You add to that the 15 million annual visitors, and there's a lot of people moving in a lot of directions all at the same time. And so the long-range transportation plan 
really identifies the needed projects for mobility for the next 20 years. So the long range plan, just a little refresher, it defines the major transportation needs. And if a project is not included in the plan, it is not eligible for state or federal funding. So this is really our opportunity to come up with that list of projects and get it out there now so that we can make these projects ready for the pipeline. We update a new, or we develop a new plan every five years, and this is because policies change, as you all just noted, things change uh, rather quickly. So we wanna make sure that the plan, we're looking at how are we growing, where are we growing, how are we moving around, are there new technologies like urban air mobility um, or new um, other types of technologies that we need to be accounting for. So we're here in the fifth year. You guys are gonna get a chance to adopt the plan uh, later this year, I believe in either October or November. Um, so this is the timeline on it. We've been working on this for, this says spring of 23. It actually started a little bit before then when we first started developing population and employment projections. We've done a whole lot of data and analysis in the back end. Um, we were just uh, working on developing and projecting our revenues out to 2050. And so at the same time that we're developing the revenues, we're coming up with our list of what we call needs. These are unconstrained by revenues. So we just come up with a list of all the projects that we need and then we're gonna compare those to the revenues and that's how we're gonna get our cost feasible plan. We're gonna see how far our money goes for the next 20 years until it runs out. And that, that process is gonna be going on for the next couple of months to final adoption later this fall. So I know we all said we all love roads and the needed roadway projects will be coming to you soon. Um, but today you're gonna get a look at the active transportation needs and some of those transit needs because the long range plan does cover all modes of transportation. And again, just to note, these are unconstrained by costs and revenues. So that's just a little overview of the long range plan and where we are and what you're gonna see today. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to, I forget who goes first, Jerry goes first to talk to you about some of the transit work that we've been doing. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Jared Austin with Ford Pinellas, and today I'm gonna to be covering the Advantage Pinellas Transit System Plan. Um, so Chelsea already did a really good job of covering the majority of this background, so I'm not gonna um, spend too much time on it. I do just wanna reemphasize that as part of the long-range transportation planning process, we are required to develop, as Chelsea mentioned, a needs plan, including a transit needs plan that demonstrates how we would maximize mobility across Pinellas County, again, if we were unconstrained by funds. Um, what funds we actually have available and how they get allocated to what projects is going to come to you at a, a future board meeting. Um, but what we're really focused on today as part of the transit system plan um, is isolating the top performing corridors from our overall transit needs plan to help set the vision for what future transit service along those corridors might look like uh, and what land use policies are needed uh, to support service along those corridors. So just providing a little bit of background and overview, um, all the planning work that we do as part of our long range transportation plan does follow what we call an investment corridor framework. This is something that came about as part of our last um, long range transportation planning cycle, um, our 2045 Advantage Pinellas plan. And what the investment corridor strategy is really trying to do is prioritize key transportation investments along those corridors that are most suitable for redevelopment countywide. Transit, of course, serves as one of many investments um, along these corridors and what I'm primarily gonna be focusing on today, but it also includes our roadway projects and as well our bike ped projects, which, which you're gonna hear about after my presentation. Um, just two projects of note that have come online as a result of the investment corridor framework include the Sunrunner project, which is already constructed and operating in downtown St. Petersburg out to the beaches, um, as well as some of the Advantage Alt-19 work that came to you all uh, a few board meetings ago and that we're now moving forward with some of the implement, implementation with um, around some of those key station areas uh, with some of our local government partners uh, and of course uh, with some support from PSTA looking at the transit vi viability along that corridor. Um, so again, just because a lot of work has already been done around Sunrunner um, and Advantage Alt-19, uh, Alt um, we wanted to take a step and look at uh, the remaining corridors within our needs network um, to see which of, of the two were the top performing. Um, so the corridors we looked at are US 19 North, US 19 South, 4th Street, 49th Street, Park Boulevard, East Bay Drive, State Road 60, and State Road 580. 
Uh, and again, it's not that Alt-19 and Sunrunner still won't remain a part of those needs um, efforts, but we just wanted to take a look at some of the less studied um, networks so that we can uh, then uh, move forward with uh, some similar Advantage Alt-19 work, but for uh, some additional corridors as well. Um, so this is a little a high level overview of sort of the step uh, analysis that we took as part of this effort. So step A was evaluating all eight corridors that you see there on that map, um, seeing which were the top performing of the, uh, the top four performing of those eight corridors. Uh, and then from there doing a slightly more refined analysis to ultimately get to the final two corridors uh, as part of this work. Uh, this is a high-level overview of uh, some of the considerations that were a part of uh, that step A analysis. We looked at uh, metrics around uh, these kind of three broad categories of equity, mobility, and land use, and you can see a little bit more detail about some of the evaluation criteria there as well. Um, I should just note that these criteria are not criteria that we just kind of pull out of a hat. They are tied specifically um, to FTA priorities just so that as we see corridors that are kind of coming up to the top that we might want to do some of that additional land use planning for, they're also those that are the most uh, uh, competitive for, for federal funds in the future. And so based on that, I know there's a lot going on in this matrix. It's basically just showing how each corridor performed uh, under equity, mobility, and land use using a good, better, best, or methodology. Um, but really what's most important is that there are scores associated with each of those, and that's really why that combined score column is, is really the most uh, important information on the screen. And from that, you can see that the top four performing corridors from at least that step A analysis include both US 19 North and South, 4th Street, and East Bay Drive. And here you can just see those top four uh, kind of intersecting with the Alt-19 network and Sunrunner as well. So moving on to that step B analysis, um, again, we are looking at equity, mobility, and land use, but adding some additional more refined evaluation criteria and also adding a fourth column for economic development, looking at future redevelopment potential, infill potential, and TOD uh, readiness. And based on that, again, looking at those combined scores, really the top uh, two performing corridors as part of that step B analysis uh, and the final analysis as a whole were both 4th Street and US 19 South. And this is just a, a vision map highlighting uh, those two corridors uh, with the broader LRTP transit needs network. Which brings me to my next point that the needs network shown on this map will still continue to remain a priority as part of our long range transportation planning process. So this includes things like that are shown on the map um, for you know, planning for connections along State Road 580, State Road 60, I-275 into TIA. This also includes um, the future Brightline connections in Tampa and connecting uh, I uh, from I-275 and Gandhi to that new station. Many of these connections also prioritize innovations and in target employment by connecting the overall network, not just through our existing and planned target employment centers, but also within the core of Gateway, which not only takes into consideration connecting to the new county campus um, with regional service to St. Pete and Tampa, but also prioritizing visitor service by connecting the broader network to PIE as well. Um, we are also still planning uh, for waterborne transit service, even though I know it's not on that map. Um, this includes development of service from uh, the Cross Bay Ferry between Apollo Beach and downtown St. Pete. And then finally, um, the CSX corridor, which while costly, still does continue to have potential for uh, future transit service within that 2050 year horizon. Uh, and it's something that we again still plan uh, to consider as part of our long range transportation planning efforts. So again, we do still all plan for part of this as part of the LRTP. Um, the purpose of this effort is really just to elevate the corridors that in the shorter term, uh, we can uh, really, uh, we can do more of the redevelopment, visioning, and land use planning around to better understand what enhanced, enhanced transit service might look like along these corridors and how to best ensure that the land uses are in place to support that transit service should it come online. And with that, oh, one other thing I should add, we are also working um, in close connection with PSTA and their ongoing community bus planning efforts to ensure that our needs plan uh, is aligning with their core network as well. So now with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. <clears throat> Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Jared. Yeah. A uh, couple of questions. So the initial eight routes, how, how did you identify those as the top performing routes to look at? Is that 
based on purely PSGA ridership or what was the... So those were actually, and I don't know if Chelsea wants to touch on this a little bit more, but they're really a part of our needs network that came about as part of our last long range transportation planning cycle. Uh, so the Advantage 2045, uh, uh, Advantage Pinellas 2045 plan. I can answer a little more yeah. specifically. It was, it, we, we did look at PSTA ridership in terms of the top performing uh, routes. Mm -hmm. Um, the 18, the 19, and the 52 have long been, or the 34, have long been productive routes, as well as the Route 60. But we really, you know, from our perspective, we're not the transit operator. We are the land use transportation right. planning agency. So we really looked at it in 2019 as where are we most likely to link jobs and housing that's affordable through redevelopment? And could there be like a faster travel time transit strategy as part of that? So that, that was the genesis of our Alt-19 plan. Um, so I think what Jared largely did was took that template from the last adopted long range plan and built on that primarily. Uh, so it's a, it's a really, it's a redevelopment and land use vision strategy more than anything. Got it. All right, thank you for that. And then could you, um, between the, the, the First scoring, step A and step B, could you talk a little bit about the differences between those evaluations, which, you know, kind of reshuffle the deck there between A and B? Yeah, so it basically, so in going to step B, again, we're still looking at those broader categories, but things like, and I'll, I'll hop between the two, sorry, I know there's a few slides in between. But so, like, if you're looking at things like under mobility, like pedestrian connections or regional connectivity, that's still considered as part of the step B analysis, and there are actual hard numbers a part of it but we just get a little bit more refined to also for the mobility element, looking at the access to jobs, access to housing, um, things like land use change. So we're looking at those projected population numbers that we have. So it's just adding some extra more refined elements to uh, those initial four that were kind of bubbling up to the top. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Anyone else? Question? Uh, Commissioner Burke. Thank you. Jared, can you go back to two slides? Keep going to that one. All right. So uh, you went forward from there explaining how the top four were so great, but what plans are in place for Safer Park Boulevard, which is the worst scoring one on the slide? Are, are, is anything in place or preparing in the future for? So um, as of right now, they're still that's still going to remain a part of our broader needs network. That's part of the long range transportation plan. But just in terms of how it's scoring there currently, it's not necessarily going to be the one that we're going to move forward with to do some of the analysis like we did for all 19 recently or um, any of the other previous networks. But it's not something that we're taking out. It's just something that at right now is not the top performing that we're going to move forward with. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I will say every scoring methodology I've ever encountered in my career is subject to local support. So it doesn't matter if it's a 6.8 or a 4.3. If there's a lot more local support yep. for doing something in the 4.3, we consider that. If there's no support for doing something in the 6.8, we're not going to force that on anybody. Yep. So this is a, a, a guide. Um, it gives us a technical basis to say these are the reasons we think this is a high priority and should be considered. But at the same time, it all comes down to where there's a will, there's a way. I'll, also, I, Jared, you probably mentioned it, but I just feel compelled since sure. I was had to do it on the record a week or two ago. Um, we're mode neutral in all this. We're not really talking about a specific technology or a mode. Uh, none of this envisions lane repurposing. Um, this is all just level of investment um, that we would look to consider for some type of transit investment in a corridor. So it doesn't really say it's going to be a rail or a bus or taking a lane or anything like that. By the way, when I told my sister that I took a lane from a road, she was like, who's Elaine? So <laughs> got to be careful about explaining these things. David, did you have? Yeah, just um, so on the categories in either step, mm -hmm. the, the, are they all weighted equally? Um, equity, mobility, land use? Yeah, I apologize. I don't um, have the weighting um, and the, the, the hard scoring in front of me um, currently, but we can get that information for you. Um, yeah, and the reason I'm asking, I'm looking at State Road 60 that had a good versus US 19 South that had one uh, better, and it knocked it all the way down to five. So I don't know, like, relativity and right. you know, weighting of the, two, of the three 
Yeah, that's important. Sure. Yeah, and we do have, <clears throat> yeah, I know this is kind of just a high level kind of look at how each one did, but with each of those good, better, best, there are scores. There is a weighting mechanism. Um, I don't have that information on me, but I will definitely ensure that it gets sent out as well. More conversation to come. Up. Yes, yes, definitely. Commissioner Eggers, I mean, uh, Gerard. Thanks. Um, I had asked about this um, in a previous conversation um, earlier this week, but Almerton Road, 688, doesn't even show up on the map. And uh, I'm wondering, I'm wondering what, how the decision came about to not include it, at least for consideration. Uh, there is a major activity center at uh, 688 and Seminole Boulevard. Uh, there's uh, a, a real need for some uh, improved mobility. Uh, and I'm not advocating that it should be there. Uh, I believe there are land use opportunities there for, uh, you know, for affordable housing. There is development that's going on there now. So can you um, enlighten me a little bit? Yeah, so I know, again, Almerton is still considered part of our needs network. Um, oh, the parcel side, yeah. Um, so I guess <clears throat> in terms of the selection um, for, oh, jumping all around. Um, one of the things that we did consider along um, Almerton, uh, specifically for this analysis, was related to some of the parcel size. Do you want to provide a little bit more clarity on that, Chelsea? Yeah, thanks. So one of the considerations that went into uh, kind of determining which quarters to look at, and that is still one of our um, transit and land use um, corridors that's identified in the long-range plan. But for this exercise, we did look at parcel sizes and opportunity for redevelopment. And when we took a look at that land use component, Roosevelt was really just weighted much, much higher than Olmerton was. That isn't, doesn't, that doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities along Olmerton, and we'll continue to explore those. But just when I kind of came to what are the top corridors, parcel size and redevelopment potential were the ones that kind of pushed Olmerton below some of the others. All right. Um. Respectfully, I think there's some pretty there's some pretty nice parcels along Elmerton, but like I said, I'm not going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to risk my life on that. So, all right, as long as, and I'm sure that Elmerton is still under a lot of consideration. Yes, absolutely, and as part of the Advantage Alt 19, that intersection of Elmerton and Alt 19 was specifically looked at uh, very closely because we know that there's a huge opportunity right at that exact location. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to continue to explore all possibilities going forward. Pretty heavy east-west corridor there. So, okay, thank you. I think it's interesting to point out um, that Palm Beach County, which is a lot like Pinellas in a lot of ways, except a, a million more people, um, is planning for uh, a light rail system in Okeechobee Boulevard, which is their Olmerton Road. It's an eight-lane corridor that goes east-west across Palm Beach County. Uh, I don't know how financially feasible that is. They're going to have to do a lot in order to get there, but they've the MPO there has adopted a plan for light rail in the Okeechobee Road corridor. Um, we can certainly take another look at it and compare it with these scores, but part of the limitation on Olmerton is that it's just a lot of single-use uh, industrial warehouse, which doesn't have a lot of employee density. It has employees, but not a lot of employee density in one location. So that's always been a limitation on Olmerton. But we do have a ripe opportunity at the ICOT Center, as we discussed. So what I can take away from what you just said, Witt, is I can go back to our commission and tell them that we're going to put light rail along uh, Almerton Road? Just tell them to look east at Palm Beach County and look yeah, and see what okay. they're doing at Okeechobee so, Road. Uh, we'll be very excited about that. Thank <laughs> I you. think they're planning to run it down the median, though, by the way, just FYI. There's no median left on Almerton Road, which is, Thank you. Anybody else? Just one, one last question. Commissioner Rogers. Um, just on the um, opportunities like connecting the tourism areas um, with international airports. Um, where, does that fall under economic development? Correct. So, yes. so if you look at um, category, uh, the first phase where State Road 60 falls out, and the second phase, economic development is used um, more, mm -hmm. 
and yet they're not in the running still. So how does how does that kind of circle back to, is it? How does that circle back to see why that may not maybe has more of a priority than it would have had? Yeah. Um, so I think the the theory there was again just using those kind of starting categories just as a template to kind of almost like a weed out methodology. Um, I think that's a fair um, point to bring up um, with regards to, I know, State Road 60 and, and the 580 connection as well. Um, it's something that we can certainly look at um, a little bit more closely. I know we're not asking you to vote on anything today. Um, so as we kind of advance some of this information, we can we can look into that in more detail. Again, depending on waiting and right. such, that economic development piece yep. gets factored out almost for, mm -hmm. for State Road 60. Um, if, anyway, thank you. Yep. Anyone else on this? Don't take that slide down. I want to make reference to it in just a minute. Pete, I hope you heard that. Um, is there anything else from any of the members on this? No? Uh, so I would just like to put on everybody's radar because it's a really important issue that we never take time to talk about here. But I think it's important that we do at some point with, and I don't know if that's in a workshop or in the executive piece that we had before this meeting, but keep in mind when you read that third point down there, elevates quarters that would be the most competitive for federal dollars. If we have a project that we want to move forward as it relates to being sensitive to the quality of life that we want for our citizens and our tourists and our county and our region in the future. I don't know what that looks like when you're not talking and working on it from, a, from the pro perspective of there's five different steps that you have got to go through and check the box in order to qualify for federal dollars. And we worked for seven and a half years on PSTA to bring those federal dollars to launch the Sunrunner line. And that's a really, really big deal because it is recognized uh, in DC and it is highlighted in the national conversation going on about how you get big projects done. So you do need, as, Commission, as Mayor Bojowski said earlier, you do need a champion that's really willing to learn those priorities, work on those priorities, and be your, your voice for this county and this region at the federal level. And that is not insignificant when you recognize how difficult that is to get done. Um, I was very fortunate, some of you know, to be part of a delegation that went to Washington that spoke to the Congress and the Senate and the President about the need for these federal funds. And we put together a think tank group that joined us from the entire region to talk about how important it was. And that's how Brightline got its foot in the door and now is poised to bring Brightline from the Orlando area over to Tampa. And then you've got to start thinking about, uh-oh, here comes all these people that have come all the way from South Florida on Brightline, getting off the train in Tampa and then what if they want to come over here? So, you know, these visionary conversations are critical to keep the process moving forward. So, that's all I have to say about that. Thank you Thank so you. much. All right. Um, now we're on 6H. What? We're going to go to part two of this. Oh, there you go. Oh, that, hi, hi. Sorry. 
Good afternoon. I'm Catherine Telez with Fair and Peers, and I've been working with Ford Pinellas, Ford Pinellas staff on the update of the active transportation plan. Um, so I'm here today to share with you everything that we've been, been working on. Um, so really, the main goals of this update are to ensure the plan's consistency with other planning documents that have been adopted since uh, the original active transportation plan was prepared back in 2020, and then align the plan with current state of the practice, and then evaluate the feasibility of the previously planned projects. Um, so today, I'll just provide sort of a brief project overview, let you know um, some of the analysis that we, we conducted, some of those results, um, and then how the various documents were updated. Um, so as I uh, mentioned, this plan is an update to the 2020 plan. Um, and things that we incorporated were an update to the uh, bicycle level of traffic stress analysis. We also looked at pedestrian level of comfort. Um, and then we also paired those analyses with accessibility. So we wanted to understand where in the county it was perhaps comfortable to, to ride a bike, but um, and maybe there was lots of things that you could access. And then conversely, maybe where it's not all that comfortable to walk or bike, but there's a lot of great things that people might want to get to. Um, and then we went through a process of updating all the various uh, background documents. And then ultimately, this plan will be incorporated into the long range transportation plan process that, that Chelsea mentioned earlier. So jumping right in, um, the level of traffic stress analysis and the pedestrian level of comfort analyses, these are quantitative analyses of how comfortable it feels for somebody who might be walking or biking. Um, and there's a lot of data that goes into these analyses. Um, so on the bicyclist level of traffic stress, things that go into the assessment are what type of bike facility do you have, if you have one at all? Um, what's the volume of traffic? what's the speed of that traffic, um, and a whole host of, of other factors. Um, and then on the pedestrian side, factors that go into it are if you have a sidewalk or not, how wide the sidewalk is, is there a buffer between the sidewalk and the travel lane, um, and then again, the speed and volume of traffic and the number of travel lanes. Um, and then the analysis results are, are shown here on the screen. So it's um, into four categories. So level of traffic stress and pedestrian level of comfort one and two are fairly comfortable. Um, most people would feel comfortable walking or bicycling along these roadways. And those are shown in the, the blue and green colors. And then um, level of traffic stress and pedestrian level of comfort three and four, not all that comfortable. Um, and those are shown in the, the yellow and, and red here on the screen. And then I just wanted to note that we uh, prepared the analysis for all roadways within the county, um, and all of these data layers are available um, on Forward Pinellas' website, or they will be soon, and then available for anybody in the region who might want to use them for their, their local planning um, projects. What that says is that people are more comfortable by this walking around than they are biking around. No, this is just if you are biking, how comfortable you might feel. Right. And that's on the, 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 the left side there. Um, and then the other one is just how comfortable you might feel walking. Well, that's this, what I'm saying. But it looks like there's a lot of blue on the walking. To me, that means comfort, right? Yeah, so those are, are more comfortable for walking, meaning that you have a, a sidewalk, um, most likely has some sort of a, a buffer, perhaps a vehicle. Um, fewer vehicle travel lanes, and then, yeah, those same roadways might be uncomfortable for somebody bicycling, because perhaps there is no bicycle facility. Well, that's what I'm saying. So it's a lot more comfortable with people walking around our county than they are biking around our county. Co correct, yeah, from that perspective. Okay. Um, we then also wanted to understand, you know, where people might get to walking or bicycling. So we did an accessibility analysis looking at, um, schools, parks, and various activity centers throughout the county, and um, how many that you could walk to within five minutes, within 10 minutes, and then within 20 minutes. Um, and we've created a host of accessibility sheds, which were then summarized for all of those different land uses and then for, for walking and bicycling. Um, so you can see that in sort of the more densely developed portions of the county, so mostly St. Pete, Largo, Clearwater, um, there's a lot of sort of destinations within a, you know, 20 minute walk or, or bicycle ride. Um, 
as compared to, to some other parts of the county. But this is just helping us understand where there's a lot of destinations that people might want to be able to walk or bicycle to. We then combined the comfort and accessibility analysis results because we wanted to understand where you might have lots of great things to walk or bike to, um, but perhaps not the best facility to accommodate that walk or bike trip. And this will just help in future planning uh, processes to really understand where you might want to prioritize different investments so that people um, have improved options for walking and biking to, to various destinations throughout the, the county. Um, so the, the orange, red color, then those are roadways where there's lots of destinations, um, but not a very comfortable walk or bike ride. Um, and then when you look at the, the blue, those are, are areas where it is lots of destinations and a comfortable route. So um, again, these are available. Um, online, so if anybody wants to use these for their local planning processes, they're available and they're um, all incorporated in the updated plan. Um, so that was sort of the, the core of some of the analysis updates. We also refreshed a host of the maps to reflect projects that had been constructed between 2020 and 2024. Um, so now I'll, I'll yes. On, <clears throat> does this take into account trails as well? Yes, it does. Okay, so some of these things are not just roads, but some of them are trails? Trails, correct. Yeah. Okay. It would be nice to know which one are trails. But, and I'm sure that um, they're not quite as viewed as comfortably as they once were. I'm on my, like, you know, concern about how we're using the trail these days. So thank you. That's a good question. I guess does level of traffic stress cons uh, consider um, – trail volume and capacity and congestion? Is that, or is it more of the um, side friction from traffic adjacent and speeds? Yeah, it's Can you more, elaborate on that a little bit? It's more related to vehicular traffic, but that's a great point because I know portions of the Pinellas Trail do get rather congested um, during some times of year and you have the friction added with you know, e-bikes and scoot, you know, there's a, a lot of different things that are going on. So unfortunately, these analyses do not take that into consideration at this time, but I think that's a, a great note for future analyses to maybe figure out how to incorporate something along those lines. It's probably more stressful for the pedestrian than the bicyclist in those congested areas. I have a quick question. So did, did any of this analysis include interviewing cyclists or pedestrians? No, not, not this, uh, because this is considered to be an update. Um, so next time there's a wholesale refresh of the plan, I, right. I think there'll be a lot more public engagement. Just looking at some of this as a runner and a cyclist, I don't agree with some of this. I mean, just from actual experience. You know, for instance, the, the section between from Clearwater Beach to Bel Air Causeway is red I, versus Indian Shores and Indian Rocks is is at least according to this, more, less stressful. And I would completely disagree with that as somebody that rides that all the time. Yeah, and that is the challenge with doing a, an analysis like this at the scale of a county. It's hard to get some of those local details exactly right. And we also have to acknowledge that everybody's individual experience may differ. Um, and so the analysis process done here was based on the FDOT multimodal um, analysis guidelines. Um, so it's intended to be a generalized analysis. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, like that particular section I was talking about has bike lines, bike lanes both ways. So to me, it's accessible and safe. But according to this, if, if, if I was looking at this, deciding where to ride it, and I didn't know the area, I wouldn't ride there. And on-street bike lanes on a you know multi-lane roadway with high-speed traffic. Only 35 miles an hour there, though. You're talking about the bike lanes on yeah. Gulf Boulevard, south of uh, the San Key Bridge. Uh, between Bel Air Causeway and Sankey Bridge. Yeah, they're skinny bike lanes. So, I mean, that's, that's a consideration. When I've ridden out there, I've not been very comfortable because they were so skinny. Okay. You know, so I, I think her point is you've got two different users and it, we're not all gonna agree on everything. But I, thank you for bringing that up. We did do surveys of bicyclists yeah. and pedestrians as part of on the trail and the general survey. So we'll try to weave some of that in here as well. Right. 
so the 2020 Active Transportation Plan um, really consisted of a, a summary document and then a host of technical uh, memorandums to support that summary document. Um, so I won't go through all of the specific details, but these slides really show you know, the, the core of what was in the 2020 document and then the, the highlights of what was updated. Um, so for the, the 2024 update um, and the existing conditions memo, it was really just refreshing everything to reflect what was on the ground in 2024 um, and a host of other data and plans that had been adopted since 2020 to make sure that we were reflecting um, the, the current conditions. In the best practices memo, um, this memo sort of summarized some best uh, practice resources and design guidelines since 2020. A number of uh, updated manuals have been published, including the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. There was an update to that in December of 2019 um, with a host of uh, modifications for bicycling and pedestrian facilities. So those were all updated um, as well as PROGRAG, so that's the Public Right-of-Way Accessibility Guidelines. Um, so all of that, that information was incorporated into the 2024 update. Mm -hmm. um, the safety analysis was updated to reflect the Safe Street Spinellis plan and other crash data um, since the 2020 plan was prepared. And then in the facility type uh, memo, we incorporated a host of other potential uh, treatments um, that have come online and, and more prevalent um, since 2020. So some of those include having the accessible pedestrian signals, directional curb ramps, um, lighting, uh, making sure that we have those adequate nighttime lighting levels, um, having an exclusive pedestrian phases, um, and then appropriate speed limits for, for all road users. So I think that gets back to, you know, on a trail, making sure if you do have a mixture of trail users um, that you have posted speed limits where it makes sense. Um, and then the analysis memo, this incorporates the level of traffic stress, pedestrian level of comfort that I shared previously. Um, and then we also incorporated, incorporated the latest equity analysis um, into that as well. Um, and then in terms of the, the project concept summaries, then the top 10 priority projects were retained from the 2020 plan. We did contact all of those local agencies to make sure that there was still that local community support and confirm that. Um, and then we updated some of the planning level costs. As you all know, some of the, there's been a lot of cost escalation since 2020. So we wanted to make sure that those cost estimates were, were up to date. Um, and then all of that was incorporated into the uh, summary report, which also includes a discussion of some of the pilot projects that came out of the Safe Streets uh, Pinellas plan. So that's using technology for doing near miss analysis to improve safety for all road users. Um, and then the city of St. Pete did a partially protected intersection along the Pinellas Trail. And there were some before and after studies on that to, to document the benefits of it. And we um, included that in the plan as well. Um, so next steps from, from here are really to incorporate this updated plan into the 2050 LRTP updates that are going on. So happy to answer any additional questions. Questions, anyone? Thoughts, concerns, anybody? No? Great job. Wow, good job. Thank you. We had lots of questions along the way, so thank you very much. All right. And now we're on six. What? What am I missing? Okay, well, that's what I thought. All right, the draft transportation priorities. Thank you, Chelsea. All right. <laughs> Sorry, my eyesight is failing me today. So this is not an action item for you today. Uh, we want to make sure that you have a couple opportunities to take a look at this before um, we finally adopt uh, the, the transportation priorities for 2024. We do adopt uh, the priority list annually. 
And upon adoption, we send it over to the Florida Department of Transportation, and they use that to uh, develop the, um, the work program, the Transportation Improvement Program that you're going to see and also adopt in June. So when the TIP comes to you in June, that'll be based off of the priority list that you adopted last year. So typically what the Department of Transportation is, will do is they'll start at number one on the list and they'll keep going down until they run out of funding. Um, so we do keep our projects on the list until they are 100% complete. So in your packet, you'll notice that the projects at the top do not have a number attached to them. They have the letter P. That means that they are programmed, they are fully funded. And then there's an unfunded portion of the list as well. I will note that in your packet, anything that is highlighted indicates a change, um, and the multimodal priorities and the transportation alternatives priorities are listed separately. Just because transportation alternatives, or TA, is a very specific grant program for bike ped projects, and it's a pretty small pot of money as well, so we do keep that one broken out separately. So the first thing, uh, the first list we're going to focus on is the multimodal priority list. Um, and I will note that there are four projects that were on the list last year that have been completed. So they're being uh, removed from the priority list at this time. That includes the North Gap of the Pinellas Trail Loop, the Harn Boulevard Overpass, operational improvements on 4th Street. This is in the downtown area from 5th Avenue South to 5th Avenue North. And then the Alt-19 roundabout, everyone's favorite roundabout. What's the North... Um the North Loop, the North Gap, how, what, what are you referencing there that's completed? The that's the stretch from the Outfall Canal down to Enterprise Overpass. The stretch um, but not including. Correct, not including the, uh, the Outfall Canal that's Overpass. still there a little bit. Correct, and that gap, I believe, is about to be under construction yeah. any day now. Okay. Thank you, it is under construction. Um, there are three projects that are newly funded, so they have moved from the unfunded portion up to the program portion. That includes uh, intersection improvements along First Avenue South. This was the Complete Streets project uh, that was added to the priority list last year in downtown St. Petersburg. Uh, Catherine noted it in her presentation that St. Pete had uh, a temporary intersection improvement at First Avenue South and Second Street. Because of the positive uh, feedback and positive results of that improvement, the city had applied for funding to do similar treatments along other intersections uh, along First Avenue South, so that is that project there. We've also uh, received funding to fill in some sidewalk gaps on the state roadway system. Uh, they are sprinkled kind of throughout the county. We're going to be working with FDOT on how exactly we're going to prioritize the which, which gaps get funded first, but that is there's construction funding out there. And then also on I-275, from 38th Avenue North up to 4th Street, this is the construction of uh, interstate express lanes and lane continuity improvements that will this is from the governor's Moving Florida Forward announcement that came out a few months ago. Uh, this is now fully funded in the work program. In terms of new priorities, there aren't too many. Um, one that we have is number three on your priority list is the Grand Central District Curb Extensions Project. Uh, this is the Complete Streets Project that was applied for by the city this year and was uh, recommended for award uh, for funding from this board. Um, you'll notice that it's a new project and it's at number three. This ties back to what I had said about the department starting at the top of the list and moving down until they run out of funding. And you all have a policy of uh, programming up to $1.5 million annually for complete streets projects. So each year when we get one of those new complete streets projects, we put it near the top of the list and that way we can pretty much ensure that it gets funded in the new fifth year. So that's this project here. And then there's some random kind of uh, shaded in um, boxes on the priority list. These are really just some uh, project updates uh, that have come about as a result of us seeing the draft work program. Uh, one is on the regional van pool. You'll notice that the PSTA is written in the responsible agency box and it is shaded in. That is because uh, PSTA took over the regional van pool service from TBARDA, which is now defunct. So we've made that update on our priority list to ensure that the funding goes towards uh, PSTA. The design has been funded on the Salt Creek Trail. This is a trail extension from Lake Megory up to 18th Avenue South in St. Petersburg. Uh, design has also been funded on another stretch of I-275 from 375 up to 38th Avenue North. That ties in with the Interstate Express Lines. Uh, pl a planning study has been funded on I-175 from the Interstate over to 4th Street. Uh, this comes out of the Downtown St. Petersburg Network Mobility Analysis. I think I got the name right. I might have missed a word or two. Uh, so that planning, uh, the scope for that study is underway right now. And then design is funded on 3rd and 4th Streets in downtown St. Petersburg. This is for redesigning those corridors to go from one-way pairs into two-way uh, cross-sections of streets. Question. Um, 
Um, I-75 from I-270 to Fourth Street, what, what is the, what's being looked at there? That's I-175. Uh, that's looking at the, the future of the corridor, really, and if there are any opportunities to better reconnect the community on either side of that corridor. Uh, right now, it really divides that community in two and provides not just a physical but also a visual buffer between the gas plant district and the Campbell Park neighborhood. Uh, so that planning study will look at some options to see how it can be improved. All right, some other project updates. Uh, number 20 on your list is the Pinellas Trail Loop, the San Martin seg segment. Uh, design has been funded on this. Uh, that's connecting 83rd Avenue North in St. Petersburg up to Gandhi. Um, on State Road 60, the project used to say multi-use accommodations. We had envisioned this to be some kind of trail connection between uh, the US-19 area and the Druid Trail over to the Courtney Campbell Causeway. Um, but we have since had some conversations with Florida Department of Transportation, and we'd like to expand the scope of that project to look at overall mobility along the SR-60 corridor from the roundabout over to the Veterans Expressway. Uh, so the scope has expanded on the project description there. The Gateway Intermodal Center uh, is currently number 27 on the list. We are recommending that that project be removed from the priority list at this time. Uh, the Florida Department of Transportation cannot fund a project if a local partner does not come forward with a very specific ask. Uh, FDOT can't just put money on an idea. They need a very defined co uh, project concept and a location. Because that has not yet been established for the Gateway Intermodal Center, we are re recommending that it be re removed at this time. We can always add it back on in the future if we get uh, a local partner that wants to take on the project and we identify a location for it. And then the last one there, number 31, 78th Avenue North from 49th Street to 34th Street. Design has been funded on this. This is a City of Pinellas Park project. Uh, they actually did some complete streets planning work um, on this corridor with a grant from Ford Pinellas a number of years ago, and they're now moving forward with implementation of that project. What do you hear about the 118th? When's that gonna be open for? I will defer to FDOT on when 118th Gateway Expressway will open if they'd like to share any information. Yeah, and, and tell me if I got anything wrong, but it looks like it'll be uh, late April, possibly, for opening. I think the last elements are complete, so we're, we're excited to see that happen. April 22nd. We'll hope for good weather, and April 22nd is the target date. And we look forward to removing that project from the priority list at some point when it is complete. Um, the other list is the transportation alternatives list. Um, these are two separate lists in your packet, but I've just kind of combined them for the sake of this presentation. Um, one project on the list has been uh, has received full funding, and that is Pinellas Trail uh, Neighborhood Connections in St. Petersburg. I've included this image from my former neighborhood, a nice unofficial connection to the Pinellas Trail. Uh, the city is looking to make these a little bit more official so that people aren't working walking through dirt and mud uh, often to get to the trail. Um, and this is at five different locations throughout the city of St. Petersburg. There are also two projects on our priority list, uh, the new numbers one and two. They have both received design funding. One is for the Joe's Creek Trail through the unincorporated Lelman community, and the other is for Sunset Way on St. Pete Beach. So for the next steps, we are gonna continue to refine the list in your packet. We even had an internal meeting two days ago and made a whole bunch more changes that are reflected in the PowerPoint, but not on the copy in front of you. Um, so we're gonna be working with our local partners and FDOT to finalize these lists, and we'll bring them back to you uh, in June for final approval and adoption, and then we'll transmit them to the department for funding consideration. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Councilor Floyd. Yeah, I've got just a couple of questions. The first is that we talked about this, um, I think it was last year, um, communicating with FDOT about projects that had shortfalls um, and trying to get them funded first. I just wondered what's been going on with that kind of thing. So we have had a number of conversations, particularly with the city of St. Petersburg. Uh, they, your staff did share that there are some projects that have a shortfall. We've been trying to work with them, mm -hmm. um, but we have been regular, regularly communicating to try to make sure that we can get those projects funded. 
Um, some of the challenges with um, a couple of the projects in the city are that um, there are some items that the department is not able to pay for. It's just not allowed by virtue of the program. Um, and I know with inflation, those have become more of a challenge as well. So we are trying to work through that and we are looking, maybe not in the first year of the work program, but some of the outer years, we are reshuffling some projects to make everything whole. Okay, thanks for that. And then the second thing is, is that, um, let me make sure I get this right. Uh, I just wondered how things were chosen, like to go from unfunded to funded, just what that process looks like. I mean, I've got a project on here that's been unfunded. It was on there last year, and then this year it's still unfunded. I'm not saying it should be or shouldn't be. I'm just wondering like what that process looked like. So typically when it comes to funding the projects, FDOT starts at number one and goes until they run out of funding. Okay, okay. Um, when we add the projects to the list, we do have a technical scoring criteria and mm -hmm. ranking that we go through. Mm -hmm. um, that is completed with at least two members of staff and then agreed upon with a member of the, applica the applicant entity, if you will. Okay. Um, so we make sure everyone's on the same page with scoring, we add them in rank order, and then we keep going. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. I just wanted to be sure. Um, so, you know, as time goes on, things will move further and further up. Yes, that is the goal. And especially with the transportation alternatives list, yeah. we try to keep it very short mm -hmm. because we don't want to make it where, you know, 10 years from now, we finally fund your project and you've mm -hmm. done it already. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll see that we are not adding any new projects to the bottom mm -hmm. of the list this year mm -hmm. in an effort to try to keep it short so we can keep the projects moving. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's fun because the thing that I'm most in, well, the thing that I'm, keyed in on right now is at the very bottom of the list. So we'll move up next year, I promise. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. All right, uh, thank you very much for answering my questions. That's all, thanks. Yeah, um, so you were talking about count, or somebody was talking about counters earlier. Do we have counters being set up on some of the new areas, the new trail that's being constructed or has been, has been constructed? Not yet. Um, I will say that the intent was initially to expand to the new sections of trail. Um, we did work with the county a couple months ago to try to identify some locations where those count where that county equipment could be set up. And there are some challenges because it's in the Duke right away and we can't put anything vertical. And I see Kyle coming up to help me out. Thank you. So we haven't installed any, but FDOT actually just installed one, I believe just north of Chestnut Park. So on the loop. On the east side. That, that's not on the that's not on the Duke Energy right of way. No, it's along the road. It's along McMullen Booth. Duke Energy comes up a lot, don't they? Um, yeah, they on, they don't want vertical elements yeah. in their right of way typically. Well, they don't want vertical elements. We know that they chop trees down a lot nowadays. So, uh, the, yeah. Um, I know. Well, I mean, it's a it's a problem. Um, so that's the, the counter is obviously really important. Not that I'm pushing at all the 580 crossing right now because every time I drive up and down 580 and look north and south, there's no, hardly anybody using. I don't see it, but it'd be nice to be able to confirm that with some counters. Um, um, and then the other piece was on that continued tra trail going south towards Sunset Point. Sunset Point being a four lane road, we're using a rapid flashing light there, um, and I'm assuming that we have them at different places like that. Are we seeing any safety issues with those uh, through there? Are we had any accidents? Are we having any? I'm not aware of any safety challenges at that crossing, especially not since we upgraded it with the county a couple of years ago. They went in and added additional signage and pavement markings, um, and I don't believe that we've had any recent crashes, at least notable ones. And the only other thing I was going to say is that uh, these trail crossings, um, there's such an inconsistency, you know, when we talked some time ago about the, the, the school zones, trying to be consistent in the school zones so that when you're traveling through the county, you're, you're, you're not seeing something new all the time. Mm -hmm. I went through a couple of areas in Clearwater recently that um, there was a sign that said, um, trail crossing does not stop, mm -hmm. which means, which really, I mean, I was thinking about it, I was thinking, well, that's just goofy, I and mean, I thought, well, maybe that's what we ought to be putting in because bicyclists typically don't stop. Mm -hmm. Walkers typically do stop if there's a car there, but otherwise, so there's, there's already a, a, a folks that are doing that. Um, and I'm almost wondering, I mean, I'm not saying that's everywhere, but it almost seems like that, seem, that would be the safest way to go. 
that assumes that nobody's stopping well now we take that assumption out we just say that they won't be stopping and then everybody that crosses is is, is stopping so it, there's consistency and it is what reality is um, most of the accidents that i've seen are bicyclists that didn't stop mm -hmm. and cars assuming that they okay they're far enough back they're going to stop i'm going to go they're just flying through i don't know Trail consistency is definitely something that's been looked at a number of times over the years. Um, our agency in particular, we have done a whole study on the corridor and recommended some changes. But ultimately, it does come down to the local governments agreeing to make those changes. Um, just because, you know, Dunedin has control over uh, the crossings within their community in partnership with the county. Clearwater does the same. Um, so it's something that we, we will strive to keep working for. We're, we're still working on it. Kyle was reaching out to our partners recently, trying to get them to all agree to make some changes. Um, but we do recognize it's an issue, and we're going to keep doing it. It would be nice to get an idea what those recommendations are again, mm -hmm. so we can maybe, when we have those opportunities, to talk at county administrator, city manager conversations, you know, there can be a presentation or some discussion. Okay, we Thank you. We'd love to have that conversation. I think we are planning a Board of County Commissioners workshop in August on trail issues. So that'll be a great time to bring it up. Um, our study was from 2013, I think, but um, it's since been reinforced by the Coast to Coast Trail. Um, and uh, we have been in conversations with the staff about having that consistency, and we're very much a supporter, so you're singing from the sheet of music that we are. Um, one thing I'll note as a regular trail rider who does stop for the stop signs um, is that whenever I do stop at the stop sign and there's a car there, the car invariably stops and waves me along like I don't need to stop, and it's frustrating um, because... I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, and I want them to go, but they're sitting there waving me to go. So I, it creates... That's because they're afraid of you. It creates that tension. It's exactly what it is. They are afraid. They would rather have you move along. Yeah, but... Well, he's a scary guy. <laughs> I am very I scary. I didn't mean him you personally. You haven't seen me on a bicycle. Yeah. Uh, so we're all in favor of that consistency, and I think you need to look at the trail as, like, our linear trail superhighway, and that... You know, maybe maybe the, the pedestrians don't like that, but it is for bicyclists. Um, it's it's a maximum flow capacity facility, and it should be looked at like US 19 is looked at for cars in a way. Something to think about. Commissioner, Madam Chair, hold on, hold on here. Let's get back in order. Mm -hmm. Gina, thank you. <clears throat> Two questions um, with the Pinellas Trail and the. Um, the projects that would be in St. Petersburg. I don't know exactly where those are, but would any of that need to be modified or reevaluated based on the fact that we have an upcoming vote finally to approve the zoning overlay in the Warehouse Arts District based on the TEAL study? to um, create more opportunities for transit-oriented development with the trail going right through that area. Mm -hmm. um, there is, there's so much potential there. Mm -hmm. And I'm worried that the decisions that were made for projects mm -hmm. that have been on the list that are going to be coming up, mm -hmm. like I just wonder, are they already outdated mm -hmm. for that part of the trail, given that we're hopefully going to make this change to create some amazing mixed use development. So I can't speak on behalf of your staff, but I will say that the city came to us with those recommendations for those connections just last year. And I don't know if any are specifically in the warehouse arts district, um, but I will definitely circle back with them after this meeting and we'll take a fresh look at that to be, yeah. to be sure. I will too. Okay. Thanks. My other, <clears throat> my other question is regarding the Salt Creek Trail mm -hmm. project. It says that that one is for um, a bike path or trail, and you said from, and it's, I guess, from Lake Megory to 18th Down Avenue. To 18th. Yeah, it, it snakes around a little bit the with creek the preferred does. alignment. Yeah, and but, I think it goes over to 7th Street, and then it truncates at MLK yes. in there. Yes. So is that, along, is that actually along 
um, East Harbor Drive and West Harbor Drive? Only out? a small portion of it is. And then okay. it, it generally follows, I believe it's 7th Street to get up towards 18th Avenue South. Um, the city staff put together an alignment um, for for the project when they put it on the priority list. Yeah. For some reason, I just I just can't remember having seen it before, and I'm, I was having a hard time picturing it. Do you know where I might be able to find a map? I'll send it to you. Thanks. You bet. That's all. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Mayor Bajowski. Thank you. I just wanted to jump on something uh, Commissioner Eggers was saying about consistency. I think because we have such a large county and that it's very you know diverse and different in so many areas, I think what, we'll, what we would end up with, and I, I have seen the study you're talking about, but I'm sorry it's been so long because it, it really is kind of old. Um, I, I think it, you're going to get maybe five or six different kinds of things that work depending where you are. Um, I think that's what we'll end up with. But since we had Secretary Gwynn here, I had to just put a little shout out. Please don't take our light at Skinner Trail Crossing away. I just had to say that in public. Everybody in the city wants to keep it. It is working so well. Even with a roundabout, Commissioner Scott and I were out there looking at it uh, last Friday, was it? I, I think it'd be just fine. Um, I'd rather take it out later if we find that it's slowing things up because um, it really has literally been a lifesaver. It's a rarity to see anybody blow through there. And I think until people get used to roundabouts, I'm more worried about that than I am about the trail crossing or it being slow. I just want to hang on to that and not change to... People just don't know what that is. And if we start throwing new things at them too many new things at them. I let them focus on the roundabouts for a while. Just my humble opinion. Thank you. Anybody else? Anyone? No questions, concerns, or thoughts. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Good job, Chelsea. Thank you. Okay. And um, <coughs> director's report. And I'll go fairly quickly on this. Just in terms of the spotlight update, um, wanted to let you know that we've had a couple of productive meetings now with um, the Florida Department of Transportation and Pinellas County and the city of Clearwater concerning the State Road 60 Gulf to Bay uh, quarter study um, that we're going to be looking at. Uh, the department has identified some funding. They've asked uh, for some partnership on the funding for that quarter study with the city and the county. And the staff are getting um, together separately, and they'll be coming back in the next few weeks to um, have a, uh, a meeting on um, areas where we are in agreement and just make sure we're all together on the same page before we um, put our resources together. Uh, Ford Pinellas has not specifically yet been asked to participate in that quarter study, but I think we'd be willing if, uh, if, if that's necessary, and we can certainly move to prioritize it if necessary. Um, but I think that's a, um, a good approach to look at the entire Gulf to Bay corridor rather than just focusing on a, a single intersection at Gulf to Bay and Belcher. The study limits I'd like to see would be from the beach to Rocky Point. We may be from downtown to Rocky Point, uh, but we'll continue to have that conversation on what the limits should be. Um, the city of Clearwater, interestingly, was awarded um, uh, a grant under the Safe Streets for All program for safety uh, improvements in the Gulf to Bay corridor, but they asked for $10 million and they were awarded, I think, just a little over $1 million. Um, so they're trying to recalibrate and figure out what they're going to do with that. Um, but if that can be part of, of this quarter study, I think they would like to see some positive outcomes because that's been a high injury uh, road network for sure. Um, I'd also like to give you a brief update on uh, waterborne transportation. The St. Pete Chamber um, has been working with the Urban Land Institute to um, figure out a scope and a, a technical assistance panel to look at um, uh, ways to um, better um, improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the Cross Bay Ferry, um, particularly to connect workers to jobs in St. Petersburg from uh, Hillsborough County. Um, we are interested in, in being a partner in that effort and 
uh, have offered uh, some assistance in doing some market uh, research uh, and market segmentation analysis of who are potential users of the Cross Bay Ferry, under what conditions, um, how would you tap into that visitor tourist market as well as residents. Um, and so that's something that we'll consider bringing to the table as part of that activity. And then we are still having conversations about pulling all the grant dollars together uh, for the local match of the Clearwater uh, Ferry reconstitution of that service as a regular transit service. And I don't have new updates on that, but the conversations are ongoing. And the target for that would be to launch that service in October. So we've got a little bit of time, and um, I feel like we're, we're moving forward. PSTA is about to do its procurement um, for, for that service as well. Um, and then we're continuing to work with county on the, um, the new county campus um, at the ICOT Center on Elmerton Road. Uh, we've had uh, a couple of meetings with the staff responsible for that, and um, there seems to be some good dialogue about how to address transportation issues and access issues related to that site, uh, which is in the city of Largo, and Largo looks like they're gonna be going through the Target Employment Center process to implement the target employment uh, and industrial land study recommendations for that area. So a lot of partners working together on all these things, and that's one thing I keep reminding everybody that it is, a, it takes a partnership. Um, we will be um, holding a new um, gateway partnership meeting coming up in a few months, uh, looking to re-energize uh, that group and focus on some key um, um, tasks and action items coming out of the Gateway Master Plan that we can begin working together to advance. So I'll have more update on that in a, in a couple of months. Yes. Anything you want to mention about um, Drew Street at this point, or you want to? Um, well, there's not a whole lot to say about Drew Street. We had an election. I know the Florida Department of Transportation, I believe, is meeting with the city staff this Friday. Is that that? Thursday? Tomorrow, okay. Well, let us know how it goes. Um, and then hopefully we'll be meeting individually with the new council members and we'll have a chance to have a workshop maybe with the city council and see where they wanna go with that. If, um, if the city um, is not interested in moving the Drew Street project forward as we've designed it and funded it, um, then um, we're gonna look to a plan B to find other projects elsewhere in the county that are in the spirit of that project and we'll distribute those dollars to St. Pete and Largo and Pinellas Park and wherever and else we can. You've already got your funding commitments for Skinner Boulevard. Uh, the, sp the spirit of that, the spirit of that, pro the spirit of that project is pretty broad because of the three sections, if you will, the, the, the county, the city, and the state-owned roads are getting different treatments. Right. Okay. Right. So let's not be too constricting. Um, it, yeah, it's not all one treatment, uh, but it's all one project. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll continue to have those conversations. I meant as it relates to repur repurposing those dollars. <laughs> can... We have met internally, and we've identified five or six candidate projects that we think would be a good fit. Um, for reallocation of those dollars. Um, we're not yet 100% certain. We need to make sure the locals are in support of that. And I think before we did anything, we would want this board to understand where that reallocation might go. Uh, we'd also want the city of Clearwater to understand where that reallocation might go. <laughs> I know, everybody's got candidates. The thing is, what we've gotta make sure is the money is, is there for construction, so we wanna go, you know, my goal would be not just to spend it on a study, but to either spend it on completing design or completing construction, um, because I wanna see some tangible benefits yeah. from those dollars. And, th and that's federal funding, it's not any other funding. Maybe a little bit of state funding. Thank you. If I can just go on, the next item is a legislative update and um, uh, as was mentioned, uh, I think earlier, the governor did sign um, uh, the, the bill 1301, the transportation bill into law. Uh, that does put some additional um, restrictions on transit agencies in terms of advertising, in terms of the, the lane repurposing process for transit. Um, some of those came out of Representative Cheney's bill for PSTA and moved into the statewide bill. 
Uh, importantly, it does bring a lot more dollars to transportation. It continues the high levels of funding for transportation. Uh, the bill does change the department's mission um, from giving people transportation choices to efficiently moving people in freight. Um, I don't see a m huge material difference in that, but there are, there are some, um, some differences. Um, the, the main thing I wanted to point out, though, is in the budget that the legislature passed that has not yet been transmitted to the governor for approval, uh, there is an enormous number of legislative appropriations or earmarks in that. Um, and you've got an attachment that shows how many. I didn't go through this list and isolate the Pinellas County ones. You've got the whole statewide ones, but there are some in Pinellas County. Uh, there's quite a few in Hillsborough and Pasco County. And we've been told that those dollars are coming out of the State Transportation Trust Fund. Um, so there will be a direct impact on the next five-year work program because when these earmarks come in, they have to get funded and they kind of jump in front of the grocery line and undermine the Ford Pinellas prioritization process, uh, as well as every other MPO in the state. So um, we might see fewer projects moving into the funded list next year as a result of this record number of earmarks. So our plan is to double down with our uh, local governments and with our legislators and ask and beg and plead that they not put transportation projects in an individual appropriations request. I have a feeling I'm gonna have about the same luck as I've had the last several years, but I would just implore this board to please be mindful with your colleagues as you're talking about these earmarks, even if it's a drainage project for on a, tra on a, on a local road, if that's coming out of the legisl legislator's budget, it's probably coming out of the Transportation Trust Fund. And all I can say is it's gonna have effects. So again, that's my annual anti-earmark comment. That's it for the legislative update. All right. And for the good of the order, is there anything else that anybody would like to bring up, talk about, or address that we haven't already talked about? Um, I do want to point out in your attachments, you have a position statement from the Campbell Park Neighborhood Association in St. Petersburg on I-175. I think it's a pretty positive statement. It doesn't call for demolition of I-175 or anything like that. Uh, there is a group out there that is calling for that. Uh, I, I wanna thank our department partners for uh, being excellent partners in allocating money for an action plan to look at I-175, look at some alternatives, and participate in a good faith effort of exploring options. We should have a scope ready to review sometime this, this year and hope to get underway in the fall. With that, and we're going to be doing very robust public engagement. Uh, that's something we're going to be bringing to that scope. So um, we'll keep you posted as that happens. That's really all I wanted to highlight. All right. So that's it, right, Rick? I think so. Okay. Well, just for your information, we did uh, begin the process of evaluating Whit Blanton this morning in the executive leadership meeting. And we'll be pulling that together over the next month or so before we meet next time, right? That's right. So be prepared. If you have anything you want to say or you want to weigh in <laughs> on how you think he's doing, please communicate uh, and let us know. Now's your chance. We've got one minute. Sure. Um, <laughs> okay, speak now or forever. <laughs> so just, uh, it's going to be like last year where the... Um, uh, Tina and Maria White, who's of our HR department, is going to be asking all board members to respond to a survey, and the executive committee will consider your survey input. All right. Uh, Councillor Driscoll. Thank you. Two quick things. First, I was wondering if we have um, heard anything regarding the approval of um, the changes that we were going to make to our board. We have not. Um, since we have the department uh, here, does anybody have any information on the reapportionment status? Yeah, it's been submitted to Tallahassee, but we have received no feedback Okay. It's been, it's been transmitted up. Okay, so everything's been transmitted to the governor's office? Yes. Okay, so we're waiting to hear from the governor. And in the meantime, Chelsea, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have started work on the interlocal agreement. Have we sent the interlocal agreement? No, we have not, okay. So we will be sending the interlocal agreement around to our local government partners in anticipation of the governor signing okay. the apportionment plan. 
I'm still thinking it's July at the earliest. Okay, thank you. Um, I also wanted to share that I was unable to attend this meeting last month because I was um, in D.C. attending the National League of Cities Congressional City Conference, and um, I'm excited this year. I've been appointed to NLC's Federal Advocacy Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, so I got to attend a couple of extra meetings that really focused on that. What I can tell you all is that there is still uh, so much money, <laughs> and it is yours for the taking. It is our city's um, opportunity to really get a lot of a lot of projects in the pipeline or getting get them moving forward. For uh, so, for so many things, I mean, transportation and infrastructure has um, still got a ton of money from the bipartisan infrastructure law and um, several programs that have sprung from that. But then, you know, you look at other, other efforts that you're trying to make, especially post-pandemic, and it's just unbelievable how much grant money is out there and how much the, the, our federal agencies are willing to partner with us to help us with projects. So don't, don't wait for the county or the state to do it. Have your cities look into um, these opportunities. And I mean, we really can all work together, but I just wanted to give a heads up if, if your staffs are not really, really looking for um, all of these opportunities, they need to be diving in. If, if we don't, if your city doesn't take it, there's another city that will. So get your projects in there. I just wanted to cheer everyone on and uh, uh, remind everyone that that is, um, that is money that is supposed to go to uh, making our cities stronger, whether it's um, roads, bridges, sidewalks, uh, seawalls, uh, all, all kinds of different things. So I've got a bridge in yeah, I, I, <laughs> I've got one in my district. I like to know about but anyway just wanted to remind everyone that you know we can be asking for this funding at every level so if you're in a town or a city don't don't just count on the county or the state to bring the dollars to you how do we access information i can i can help you get started yeah Okay. Uh, yeah, more I'm happy to help. That's all. Okay. Just cheerleading. Uh, Quit had another comment he wanted to add. I forgot to mention this under regional activities. Uh, we did have a request uh, for consideration from the Hillsboro TPO. Uh, one of their members, one of their elected officials, I believe, uh, would like to see if there's interest in having a joint MPO meeting of the full MPO boards of Pasco, Hillsboro, and Pinellas, not the TMA leadership group but everybody from the MPO at a joint meeting. And I just wanted to see what the board thought of that. I don't really know much more than that was a request and it might happen later this year, it might happen next year. As we work on the merger discussion, I think we're gonna need to bring everybody together at some point. Would you all be receptive to a joint meeting of everybody? Yeah. Well, maybe you could find out what the motive is or the agenda that they wanna talk about. It is Hillsboro after all. <laughs> Chelsea, I don't know if you know anything more than I do, uh, but I, I just saw the email request. I was going to say the same thing. I mean, we don't want to undo what the TPA is doing. Right. TMA leadership. Sorry, you yeah. knew what I meant. Yeah, I knew what you meant. I, I knew I mean, it was a bunch of initials that started with me. I, I, I think one of our challenges uh, in this region is that we don't have a lot of trust with everybody. Uh, and part of that is because we're not meeting regularly. We don't know each other. We, have, we don't regularly interact. And this might be an opportunity to, to maybe start building that trust. But I, I hear you. I mean, I'd yeah. want to see. I think they're going to undo something. I, I mean, I want to trust in our representatives on the TMA to represent what we want. Okay. And I want to trust that their representatives are doing the same. David, you're on TMA with me. What yeah. do you think? Yeah. Well, first, first of all, we have um, 19 county commissioners that we are, we are, you know, we've 
gone down that path and we had two tri-county meetings last year. We were supposed to have one next week and um, Hillsborough County uh, dropped the ball somewhere and now scrambling to see if they can reschedule that. But we're trying to, what you try to do is to have three county administrators trying to corral 19 people. So when you have three MPOs, and I don't know how many members are on each of those MPOs, but it, I mean, it's a monumental effort probably. Yeah. You're talking about one a year maybe, but I think with the conversations that we have coming up, it would be theoretically nice to get together, but I still think there's a lot of work to be done well, on a smaller is, group at the TMA. Okay. And I'd like to remind you that the last time that we went down that path, David will remember this, we specifically scheduled the meeting in Hillsborough County, and I found it incredibly interesting that the Hillsborough County people didn't show up. Yes. But all of the rest of us were there. Yeah. Right, yeah. David? Yep. Oh, yeah. No, it was downtown at the, uh, I can't remember where Channel it was. But yeah. 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 So, so, so sometimes, from what I, I was ready to really get mad at the commissioners over there, but apparently it was a staff on the county commission thing that I'm talking about that dropped the ball. So um, that's what I've been told. So we'll see. But it's difficult to pull it together on just that level. So. Um, All right. Well, I'll take that under consideration. We'll have the conversation. If they can make a compelling reason for what the agenda might be, then I'll bring that back to you all yeah, for discussion. Yeah, that would be good to know ahead of time. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's it. All right. Anything? Last chance. Yes, Commissioner Gerard. Uh, are we going to get any um, data from the, in, the trail enforcement initiative from April 6th? We will. Um, I don't think we have anything yet, Kyle, but um, we'll see what we can get in terms of reports from the, the police that participated and the sheriffs that participated in that. So we'll try to do that for the May meeting. And, and when are we going to break ground on that light rail? <laughs> Stop it. You're really looking to prolong the meeting, aren't you? Oh. <laughs> okay, then for the good of the order, we are adjourned. Thank you everyone for being here.